Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, May 26, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps. From the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Zach Carter on the price of peace, money, democracy, and the life of John Maynard Keynes. Also on the program today, federal judge in Florida. Bill Clinton appointed federal judge in Florida rules that the Florida Republicans felon voting restrictions are in fact a poll tax. Republicans want to claw back Planned Parenthood's paycheck protection loans. The World Health Organization halts testing of Trump's hydroxy because of higher mortality rates. Good news, seniors sour on Trump. Bad news, Joe Biden getting advice from Rahm Emanuel. China tested 9 million people in 10 days. German government bails out Lufthansa, takes 20% of its stock. AP finds Cuomo sent 4,500 COVID patients to nursing homes, increasing deaths there. All this, your phone calls, your IMs, and more on today's Majority Report. Uh, Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you had a a good long weekend as as much as one can in this context. Um, uh, We appreciate your indulgence while we took the day off. Everybody uh, needed one. It's a very weird doing the show in this context is very strange. Because, um, one, it is, I mean, I, I, I'm not speaking for the other guys, but um, it's still not as comfortable as it is going into the office. It's not nearly as efficient. Um, and it's, uh, it's stressful. And we're off our normal schedule. We didn't have our, our vacation, which we use to recharge ourselves. But it's a weird time to take, like, five days off because what are you going to do anyways? Um, so having a, a day off here or there for everybody is um, is very helpful and we appreciate your indulgence. We don't do it that often where we don't put out content. I don't, I mean, I think I can count on my hand, uh, maybe both hands over the course of 10 years, how many times we've done that where we put out no content whatsoever. Uh, although do, do we put out that member show? We do that deep archive thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh. Chomsky, uh, Harry Shear, and Gore Vidal conversations. So, oh, well, uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, we only brought you uh, from the deep archive, Chomsky, Gore Vidal, and Harry Shear for members. You can become a member, and then I guess just hope that we don't do a show. So you get a show like that. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, and also, we now have merch. People are very excited about the merch shop.majorityreportradio.com we got our merch there so and uh on the masks uh all of the proceeds total uh go to the uh, pacific northwest uh northwest immigration center uh so uh pick up a mask if you want i like the saying on it uh so uh all that and more all right let's jump right into this donald trump is and I will say this, you know, the CDC some time ago said that if um, states started opening up, they anticipated by 
early June. I don't know what that means. First week of June, second, you know, early second week, uh, nearly 3,000 deaths a day. Now, we are still in an area, I should say, in terms of temporally, where we wouldn't necessarily see the impact of things, uh, of things, you know, loosening as it were around the country because there's a 14 to 20 day lag time, it seems to me, on deaths. And we also know that deaths are being, um, and we have, we, we know that data in certain states is being manipulated to make the deaths count seem lower. But we're only at about now and only 1,500 deaths a day, which is um, horrible and not sustainable and untenable, but it's not at the 3,000. Now, the next week or two is really going to be telling, but there's obviously a lot of pressure to, uh, to come out just because it's summer. And this, when the president of the United States basically says attacks any science as he do, that he doesn't like that does that conflicts with his agenda which is driven by the chamber of commerce and a bunch of uh, wealthy republican donors which is i.e. send everybody out we can sustain all these deaths no problem uh he responds to it in this way this is uh, he's being asked about the columbia university covid shutdown models a Columbia University analysis said that had the lockdown or social distancing happened sooner, the analysis said almost all of the lives that have been lost could have been saved. And then a New York Times reporter issued a tweet that implied you are culpable for those deaths. You know, it's a disgrace what I watch from this uh, fake news media and from some of these liberal institutions. Columbia is a liberal, disgraceful institution to write that because all the people that they cater to were months after me. They said we shouldn't close it. I took tremendous heat. You know this. When I banned China from coming in, first time anything like that ever happened, I took tremendous heat. Tremendous, like a level that I've never seen anything like it. And that went on for months. They were criticizing me. Uh, Sleepy Joe Biden said it's, I'm xenophobic, meaning I don't like people, certain people. And uh, other people said as bad as that or worse. And that was in January. And I saw that report. It's a disgrace that Columbia University would do it, playing right to their little group of people that tell them what to do. Talking about. Um, now, I should tell you a couple of things about that. One, uh, xenophobic is um, specifically you. You have a problem with uh, people who are strangers, specifically, you know, from different countries. But um, he is being interviewed by Cheryl Atkinson. May, some of you may not remember her. Uh, she is now a reporter, and I think she has a show on uh, a Sinclair media. <laughs> I don't know if it's, uh, I imagine it's syndicated throughout all the Sinclair. Sinclair, of course, is the um, right-wing local network, if you will. Um, and she was in the early um, teens, I guess, uh, 2011, 2012. She was with CBS News. And uh, she got very deep into the Benghazi thing. At times, she claimed that the Obama administration was like uh, taking over her computer. Um, she was, uh, she has in the past um, suggested that there is a possible link between vaccines and autism. Um, she, uh, just to give you a sense of, the, you know, how hardball those questions are. But this is what Donald Trump is doing in terms of the science. And this is what he does in terms of the science retroactively and going forward. We don't know that much about coronavirus, or I should say, we don't know everything there is to know about this. That's why they call it novel COVID-19, because it's new to human beings. We don't know if there's some data suggesting that over the 77 degrees, it becomes a lot harder to travel around. Plenty of data suggests that it's harder to get when you're outside. All the scientists anticipate a second wave hitting in the fall, but some also argue like we're still in the first wave. It's just that we're choosing to ignore 
the 1,500 deaths a day. But understand that this is all a political decision by Donald Trump, driven by his desire, uh, his belief that this is going to help him in the election, uh, driven by the fact that he looks at spread and deaths of the virus. And if you were to look at blue states, ones that uh, Clinton carried by by big numbers versus uh, ones that Trump carried by big numbers, less in the red states, of course, because it's less dense. To the extent that there's outbreaks there, they tend to be, um, and this is the true of, of blue states too, they, they tend to be amongst people living in poverty or people with low income who are forced to actually not isolate and semi-quarantine because they need to go out and get, uh, they need to do their jobs or they're afraid of getting fired. They need the money. And Trump's calculation is my voters don't care about those people. And so we're just going to go forward as if nothing's happening. And my other constituency, Chamber of Commerce and all these, uh, whatever, whoever they are, the Koch brothers, the Mercers, whoever are encouraging, open up, open up. So that's where we are. Meanwhile, the other constant in our, uh, well, where are we here? Do we have, uh, is, uh, oh, he is on the line. Okay, great. All right, well, let's take a, uh, a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk to Zach Carter on his new book. It's a big one. Uh, the Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure uh, to welcome, I believe, back to the to the program. He is a senior reporter with Huffington Post uh, and the author of The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. Um, Zach Carter, welcome to the program. Good to be back, Sam. So, all right, let's start um, with the... Um, let, let, I mean, let's just, I guess, let's start just historically from where he is, or maybe we should just, uh, in, in broad sense for folks, just give us the really the 60,000 foot view of John Maynard Keynes and, and how um, massive a figure he has been really in terms of, uh, of how we perceive our economy, particularly, I think, from, um, you know, the, the 20s maybe the 30s uh, into the 
really 80s, 90s uh, um, uh, across the board. But, but give us a sense of, of just where this guy is in terms of how much he has affected, in many respects, our everyday lives. Sure. Uh, you know, I think most of us, uh, or at least most people who learn about John Maynard Keynes, learn about him in Econ 101 courses where uh, they're, they're told that, uh, you know, he's, he's the guy who said governments need to spend money during recessions in order to help lift the economy out of the doldrums. But Keynes was not this, this sort of deficit therapist guy who, who worked all his life to, to try and, and, and create a legacy where people talked about, you know, how much money you should spend uh, when GDP reaches a certain particularly you know, depressing point. Um, he is, uh, I, I think, really one of these, one of the most important kind of last uh, enlightenment style thinkers who, who looked at the world uh, of economics as something that is sort of united and, and continuous with philosophy, ethics, political theory, the big questions that all of the, the major thinkers of the enlightenment uh, like you know John Locke, John Stuart Mill, people like this were uh, were concerned with. And when we when we talk about the economy, you know, even Keynes's most uh, I think virulent critics on particularly on the right um, use a sort of framework about talking about the economy that Keynes created. There was no such thing as macroeconomics before John Maynard Keynes came along. The idea of looking at the economy as this this social thing that affects everybody rather than a series of atomized individual choices. Uh, that was a new way of looking at the world. And uh, he developed that because he, he thought of economics as something that was not so much about dollars and cents and, and making equations balance just the right way, but that was, that was part of a broader social and international project. He was trying to prevent catastrophes like the First World War using economic policy. And uh, he spent most of his life on that project. In many ways, uh, he, he failed over the course of his lifetime. But after his death, his ideas, uh, some of them, in a, a sort of narrow way, became part and parcel of, of the economics profession today. Uh, and I think if you go back and, and review the work that he was trying to do during his life, you can see that it's, it's a much more, it's a much richer, much more robust, uh, much more exciting set of ideas than I think what most of us receive from our Econ 101 courses. Um, and, and I want to, I, I want to, um, I want to come back uh, to this idea of in, in some ways of like his, um, you know, I think really uh, developing the, almost the idea of a political economy in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I want to come back to that after we go through some of the, the historical points, because the interesting thing um if, from my perspective about his life is that he, he really, uh, he starts, um, he really, I guess, I guess on the scene in, in terms of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which mm -hmm. of course happens in, um, the, or I, I, during a pandemic, uh, and in many respects, um, he has, you know, the, much of the way that we're responding to this pandemic, uh, has been a function of his work. But uh, talk about his opposition to the Treaty of Versailles. And, and, and there's just one interesting thing, too, about Woodrow Wilson. I know that he had a problem with, it, with Wilson abandoning his 14 points. Talk a little bit about that, because my understanding is that Wilson had the flu. And it, it, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, look, the, it, it's, it's not controversial that uh, the... Um, the, the, the negotiations for the Treaty of Versailles, which were taking place in 1919 at the close of World War I, um, that this became sort of a vector of contagion for, uh, for one outbreak of, of what we call the Spanish flu. Um, and Keynes himself certainly came down with it. Um, he was, there was actually a, a sort of infirmary uh, on the rooftop of the hotel where he was staying, where there were so many people at the conference who were getting sick, um, they, they just had hospital beds. And he was, he was laid out for, for weeks um, and he has incredible memoirs that he wrote about it, about, uh, you know, fe feeling terrorized by the impressions that the patterns on the wall wallpaper were making on his brain. I mean, he was having hallucinations. Uh, it was it was very bad. We, we don't know if if Wilson had had the flu or not, uh, but there is there is certainly evidence that he was behaving erratically and we know he got sick. So there, there's certainly a case to be made that Wilson uh, and Clemenceau, uh, 
George Clemenceau, who was the, the, the French prime minister who was at, at the talks with him, um, both came down with it at different times. Um, we, we don't know exactly how severe their strains were. The, the Spanish flu seemed, seemed to sort of you know, evolve over time. So there were some strains that were more virulent than others. But Wilson certainly was never the same person uh, that he was during World War I uh, when he came back after the negotiations for the Treaty of Versailles. He, uh, he eventually had a, had a series of strokes and became totally incapacitated for the final years of his, of his presidency. So with, with Wilson, it's not clear, did, did he have the flu? Did he have some strokes? Uh, some, some sort of minor strokes. Uh, did the flu set off a, a, a series of strokes? You know, I, I, there, there are medical professionals who, who still argue about this, and I don't feel qualified to give a, a you know, a, a, a certain judgment w one way or the other. But we did have uh, a, a series of global calamities intersecting at the same time in 1918, 1919, with the, with the First World War, and then also this global pandemic. And these are central to John Maynard Keynes's thought. Keynes is a very different kind of economist than most people who we describe as economists. You know, when you, when you think about economics and what the discipline does, we're talking about rational individuals who are maximizing their self-interest uh, in terms of, of monetary profit uh, throughout most of their lives. And this idea for Keynes that, that we could be rational in the present without knowing what the future was going to bring was a very difficult concept for him. He didn't really believe in that. He was, he was concerned with, with uncertainty, with the idea that the future is difficult to predict, uh, not just in the, in the way that, you know, can, can we predict uh, you know, whether we're gonna go to work tomorrow, but, but w will there be uh, enormous events that will, will change the way that the world works that we don't see coming? Things like a pandemic, things like a war. And so his thinking, I think much more so than the sort of specifics about deficit spending, his thinking about how to deal with crises and how to deal with the unexpected uh, is, is unique really in the history of, of economics and is unique in the history of political theory. Uh, and when you, when you go back and look at what he had to say, regardless of where you, you are on the political spectrum, there's an awful lot in there that seems to me to be very compelling in, uh, in, in our time. Um, and so he he was an opponent of the Treaty of Versailles and felt that it was going that that ultimately what came out was just far too harsh of treatment for for Germany. Yes, uh, well, it, but not just Germany. I mean, he um, Keynes felt like at, and this is very early in his thought. This is before he does the general theory and is talking about deficits or any of that. He's a very conventional economic thinker at this point in his life. It's 1918, 1919. He says, look, all of these countries have spent all of this money and wasted all of these resources on this catastrophic war. They have, their, their workforces have been decimated. Their resources have been decimated. There's just no way that these countries can, can afford to just make enormous payments to foreign allies or adversaries after, after this war if we want to get, get going and, and have the same sort of international uh, prosperity that he, he felt the world had enjoyed in the years before the war. So he's, he's very critical of the reparations terms assessed against Germany, but he's also very critical of the continuance of the war debts uh, that were accrued by basically everybody except the United States in the, uh, it, it, during, during what was then called the Great War. So Britain, France, essentially everybody on the Allied side. He just said, we need, to, we need to cancel all of the war debts and we need to cancel these reparations ideas that are in the treaty, because if we don't do that, these countries will never get on their feet economically. They won't have the resources to take care of their people. And as a result, they're going to, you're going to breed enmity between different peoples. It wouldn't just be an economic problem. It wouldn't just be about not having enough money to pay the bills. People in one country would start hating people in another country and you would set the world up for dictatorship and war. So he was concerned about international harmony and about domestic stability. He was not concerned about, you know, about making sure that, that, that accounts were paid. He felt like that, that was sort of, that was a silly priority to become obsessed with when these other big problems were, were, were lying in wait. So, um, and it is uh, around that time where, I mean, I guess um, he, uh, and, and then he, he takes a little time to, I think, have some fun. It's, it's, it's like, um, <laughs> 
uh, in his life. But let's I, I want to get to as he starts to develop, uh, you know, um, uh, the his sort of like, broad principles of of, I guess, Keynesianism, the 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 idea of of a macro economy, uh, the relationship between money and finance to the real economy and the idea that that macro economy um, must be managed for the, the good. I mean, what, what, like, what did, what did he, how did he define that? So Keynes came of age in, at Cambridge University at the turn of the 20th century. And he was, not, he was not principally an economist. He was a philosopher. He fell in with this set of, uh, of, of ethics and, and politics thinkers um, around a, a guy named G.E. Moore, who's one of the most important uh, political philosophers of the, or ethical philosophers of the 20th century. Uh, and they, they were concerned with this vision of the good life. They, they thought, you know, what is it that you want to do with your everyday existence, with the arc of your time in the world? And they said, look, there are these sort of, sort of indissoluble, uh, wonderful experiences that, that, that make up part of a good life, whether it's just appreciating a great piece of art, whether it's falling in love, whether it's enjoying a good joke. Uh, these are the things that you cannot break down into component parts. You want to maximize the number of these wonderful experiences in your life. And he came to believe that social harmony was something that could be achieved when everybody got to enjoy those experiences. Uh, this was very much uh, a vision of the good life that was born of the, the British leisure class at this period in time. This is Cambridge University. These are, these are not people who are, uh, you know, scraping to get by on meager wages in industrial factories. Uh, they, they are, you know, they are very well-to-do academics talking about art and ideas all the time. But he thinks that this is something that can be shared generally by, by the public. And he starts trying to figure out what the, the tactics are, what, what sort of strategies you could put in place to make sure that the abundance of the 20th century, which he believes, you know, we've just never had this level of of pure material plenty in the history of the world to make sure that that abundance is distributed in such a way that people can enjoy the kind of life that he had at, at Cambridge at the turn of the 20th century. So he falls in with this, with this group of artists and intellectuals called the Bloomsbury set in London a few years after he's, he's graduated. And he really tried, this is, this is a group of people like E.M. Forster, like, like Virginia Woolf, uh, very famous artists and writers who travel all over the world. They're, they're hanging out with, Pablo Picasso in, in Paris and Gertrude Stein and, and you know, this, this, this big international milieu of, of sort of progressive intellectuals, let's say. And Keynes is, is very much part of this world, but he is also part of the very stuffy, buttoned down uh, British treasury world as well once, once the war breaks out. And so after the war, you know, he makes a lot of money off of that first book. It sells very, very well. The economic consequences of the piece, his critique of the Treaty of Versailles, that makes him a, a wealthy man. And so he starts doing a lot of the things that not only well-to-do people at Cambridge University does, you know, he starts going off and you know, doing fox hunting and all this, this crazy British aristocratic stuff. But he never loses sight of this vision of, of, of a, a society doing all these things together. And that puts him at odds with the rest of the economics profession, where scarcity is really the, the sort of fundamental underlying principle. There's not enough stuff to go around economics exists in order to maximize how much we can produce at any given point in time. And Keynes, Keynes comes to believe that that's not really the central question. The, the question is about distribution and social stability, not production. And I think even today, uh, you know, decades after Keynes was, was writing, that idea that economics is fundamentally about distribution rather than production is a very radical idea. Uh, if, if you are thinking about economics in terms of inequality, you're going to make different choices than you are if you're thinking about economics in terms of, uh, of just sheer productive capacity. And, uh, and I, I think pretty much everything that he did from the Treaty of Versailles going forward was an attempt to make sure that societies felt like they were part of the same project, that they, that they would cohere, that, they, that people would want to work together to make the things that society needs uh, in, in order to go forward, that they would not, that they would not feel enmity towards each other, that they would not be set against each other uh, in ways that, you know, I think it's pretty obvious the United States, at least, 
uh, we're, we've been set against each other over the last few years. Uh, so that 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 fundamental difference in perspective that the uh, the economy should be measured on the um, the uh, how many people are involved rather than what is produced um, in terms of getting the benefits of that economy is is that big sort of bright line that um, that 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 carries through. Yet um, he. On the and he called himself a, a liberal uh, socialist, or he he subscribed to liberal socialism. Ex- explain that, and 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 let's talk a little bit about how those principles um, would fit into today's context. Sure, and just just to be clear, you know, Keynes wrote over the course of of several decades, and he's you know his, his ideas at one moment in time are not the same as ideas at other moments in time. So there there are different interpretations of his life uh, that have been made before, but. Uh, you know, which are not crazy. Uh, I just don't necessarily think they're right. And with with the, the question of socialism, at times Keynes is very dismissive of it. He says that this is this is a, a, a silly project that that makes very little sense. But he spends much of his time trying to develop what he calls a liberal socialism. Uh, he has a, a, a sketch that he he writes in the 1920s called Prolegomena to a New Socialism. Um, he's trying to imagine a way to keep together all of the things that he loves about the liberal enlightenment tradition, individual liberty, freedom of conscience, um, the, the, the idea that, uh, you know, sovereigns should be restrained uh, and should not have you know, absolute power over their, over their citizens, uh, but, but try to fit that set of values with uh, a world in which, uh, which is, which is, confronting crises that it's never seen before. And so he comes to believe that the state is the only real vehicle that can provide uh, the stability that people need uh, and the financial security that people need because markets, as, as they're understood at, at that point in time, are, are easily corrupted by, by uncertainty. And by uncertainty, I, I mean the inability to see what's coming forward and the, the ability to become sort of collectively depressed by your prospects for the future. I think it's a very easy concept to understand when times are bad, but it's very difficult to understand when times are good. And it's the economics profession is often sort of just defined good times as normal so that the bad times are, are sort of like an aberration or an exception or an asterisk to what, uh, to, to the way the world works. But at a time like now, you know, we don't know uh, when the pandemic is going to abate. We don't know when people are going to feel comfortable going out and, and shopping again. We don't know when it's going to be safe to go out and shop again. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty over, over the future. And under those conditions, I think people have a tendency to sort of retrench, to save, to do, to, to protect themselves and, and hope for the best rather than go out and, and do the things that an economy requires in order to produce the abundance that enables uh, you know, the, the shared prosperity that, uh, that, that Keynes was so enamored with. So if you don't go out and spend and do all of that stuff, uh, you end up with an economy that, that, that just keeps shrinking. And I think for Keynes, this psychological problem um, was central to human beings. This was, this was something that, um, that affected us at all times, not just in the middle of a crisis, but it was something that we were susceptible to at any moment in time. And so you needed some sort of steady hand to steer the ship and say, okay, we're gonna make sure that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. And if you don't have that steady hand doing that, then people are prone to, to all sorts of outbursts of, of uh, rage and irrationality. He didn't have a particularly generous view of working people. You know, he, was, he was often very dismissive of, of the ideas of the proletariat and things like that that you would see in, in you know, more radical thinkers like, you know, like, like Marx. Um, but by the end of his life, he was, he was saying, you know, we really need to socialize British medicine. He was the financial architect of the National Health Service and one of the most important political stewards of that project. Uh, it, it probably wouldn't have made its way through British Parliament had Keynes not sort of lent his prestige to it when he was uh, meeting with lawmakers and talking about what an important project this was. So um, he's not just a deficit therapist. He's somebody who is willing to do very radical things politically, uh, but 
in pursuit of, I think, fairly conservative goals. You know, he's trying to prevent social unrest. I think he would have been very frightened by the the revolutionary rhetoric of the Bernie Sanders campaign, for instance. Um, but you know, he may have he may have actually found the the Sanders campaign a little bit too timid on its uh, on its its policy platform. Right. So so the impetus for his notions of of government um, participation in the economy and and the and the breadth and the depth of it it's not a function of his belief that we need to democratize anything it really is just simply a function of this is the most efficient way to um, achieve a goal so there's maybe uh, maybe a shared goal but the process part of it is um, a little bit more uh, I guess, centralized, if you will, in terms of, uh, of who gets to decide what that goal is. Um, but that government is, is, is very often the best vehicle to, um, to deal with the macro economy, I guess. Well, to be clear, the, the, you know, Keynes's views shift over time. So his, his most right. dismissive sort of uh, nastiest things that he has to say about, about like the working class are, are, are from the 1920s. By the 1940s, he's, he's a much mellower fellow. Um, so I, I think he does want to democratize the, uh, the the elements of the good life in in Bloomsbury, but he doesn't necessarily think that that the working class, as it existed in the 1920s, um, was a set of people who were particularly receptive or or interested in it. By the 1940s, he he has a totally different view and thinks that the success of new new medium like like the like radio, for instance, which hadn't existed in the in the the, the World War. Um, it, that, that this had had enabled people to appreciate new new forms of things, and he starts talking about uh, about opening community theaters in every single neighborhood of uh, of every single town in in Britain. Um, so he he does become, I think, I think a a, a small d Democrat uh, eventually. But I think for much of his life, he's he's really concerned with a sort of Edmund Burke like sense of social stability that that you want to avoid revolution. And, and the easiest way for, for the people on top to avoid revolution and to make sure that, they're, that the nice things that they like about their lives are not upended um, is, is, to, is to throw, throw not just some crumbs, but some, some real security uh, to people who are not on top, because that will keep them from revolting. Do you think, and, and I want to go to sort of like, you know, the sort of the, the uh, Keynesianism without uh, Keynes uh, and, and, and what happens then, but do you... Uh, do you think that he um, had a blind spot in terms of the idea that um, that that dynamic uh, where, you know, the the wealthy have the good life and that they should be able they should see it in their best interest to make sure that other people have um, at least a pretty good life um, to create that stability sort of, I guess, missed. I mean, there seems to me to be a quality of like, no, it's not good enough that I have a good life. It's that like um, the dynamic between me and the rest of society has to be dramatic enough that uh, for me to feel satiated, that um, there's a quality of like, it's just not, it's not enough that I have a hundred million dollars. I need to have $50 billion or something, which, you know, there's no human being who can, who can spend that kind of money, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Bezos has said, like, I, I guess I'll have to do space exploration just to burn some of that cash or something. Um, was that a, I mean, do you think he could have conceived of that type of wealth uh, disparity? It, it's a remarkable thing that a, a man who is as brilliant as John Maynard Keynes uh, had in many ways, I think a very naive view of, uh, of, not necessarily human beings more broadly, but but certainly of of the wealthy. And um, he 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 genuinely believed that people wanted to enjoy life the way he had enjoyed it at Cambridge and in the Bloomberry Bloomsbury set. Um, we would just explain why the would Bloomsbury you, set. I mean, why just, would you want to give up? The, the, go ahead. We we just uh, um, just expand a little bit on uh, on the Bloomsbury set. It's it's sort of like a sort of like hippies, sort of right. I mean, sort of like free love, like the summer of love. <laughs> Yeah, so it's sort of like uh, like turn of the century British hippies, I think. Mm. Um, I mean, look, these people are always they're artists and intellectuals and philosophers who are uh, constantly swapping lovers. Um, they are having dinner parties and drinking champagne and having their hair cut and uh, and holding art exhibitions and writing novels. 
um, you know, the, the most prominent member, I think, is, is Virginia Woolf. And I think the second most prominent member is, is John Maynard Kane. But these are people who, you know, a lot of the names haven't have been survived quite as long uh, in, in, in history uh, as, as Keynes or, or Wolf. But these are people who are very, very prominent in the, uh, the art and letters and intellectual scene of, of the time. I mean, they are, they are contemporaries with people like Pablo Picasso. Uh, they, are, they are friends with people like Pablo Picasso. So it, you know, th th this is a, a, an extremely uh, avant-garde, uh, cutting edge, certainly socially avant-garde uh, set, set of people. And, uh, and, and Keynes just can't understand why anybody wouldn't want to, what, you know, why, why, what's the point of having all of this money if you can't do what the, the Bloomsbury set can do? And, and if you can do what the Bloomsbury set can do, then what's the point of having a lot of money? I mean, the, the, the point is to do the actual thing. It's not to have uh, a lot of zeros in, in your bank account. And uh, you know you, you can't take it with you, as you know others have said. So he he was uh, you know not somebody who uh, he, he was certainly not uh, a, a, you know a person who of, of small appetites. He he was he was all about uh, doing these extravagant, grand uh, aesthetic things, whether they were they were you know sexual or, uh, or or just appreciating art. I mean, during the First World War, he even uh, figured out a way to get the British Treasury to advance him a bunch of money to go buy a bunch of paintings from uh, uh, from the Degas studio in in Paris, which had, was was putting up a bunch of stuff so that the, the Parisian government could raise money during the war. Um, and he just thought, oh my goodness, we have this amazing opportunity to get to get these Degas and get them into the the British Museum. And, and then he he got some more money of his own and bought a few and brought them back to to Bloomsbury. Uh, so he sees the good life as a set of activities, not as a, a bank account. And there's no real reason why those activities have to be exclusive for Keynes. Um, when he gets into feuds later in his life with people like Friedrich Hayek, who is sort of the founder of neoliberal economics uh, and of neoliberalism as a political theory, I think is even much more, much more important than his, his actual economic contributions. Um, Hayek has a view that scarcity is really central to the preservation of that kind of uh, that kind of culture. That if you don't have scarcity, scarcity is sort of the moment where you have to choose between different things. And if you don't have to choose between one thing or another, you never will make that choice. And so you need to have not only scarcity of resources, but but uh, a limit on who can participate in that type of culture. If you don't have that, then the aristoc there will never be an aristocracy that forms that decides these things are good and we must pass down appreciation of these things between generations. And you will never develop the sort of cultural traditions that both he and Keynes thought were, uh, were, were so important and so, and so beautiful and so wonderful. Uh, Keynes just didn't share that belief. He thought, he thought there was nothing uh, exclusive about this, this type of lifestyle that people could enjoy it, that, that it would be a fine thing for everybody to like, uh, to like art and letters. Uh, just as fine, if not finer, than only a, a select few. Um, and so let's talk about that, um, that uh, the, I guess, that battle that begins very close to, I guess, more or less uh, upon Keynes's death. I mean, I think that's probably more coincidental because it's really about after World War II when uh, guys like Hayek go to uh, Mont Pelerin and, and, and develop a competing theory of of economics that was based on basically what you just laid out for us uh neoliberalism was uh i guess a i mean it ostensibly is just about markets but it also pushes this notion that really there is a role for government and it should really basically promote the interests of a very narrow few that will ultimately benefit everybody else as opposed to pursuing benefits for everybody um, talk about mm -hmm. that, the sort of the, the dual, I guess, the competing philosophies and when um, neoliberalism, I, uh, maybe you would agree, wins out at one point, um, sometime sure. in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. So, I mean, Hayek and his most sophisticated uh, colleagues in, in the neoliberal movement, which begins in the 1940s, as you, as you note, um, they, they don't think that markets are the sort of like natural state of affairs 
um, that governments then supervene on after the fact to, to redistribute things through taxes. They think that markets are things that are constructed by the government and they're constructed to do specific things and how you construct the market matters quite a bit. Uh, and so Hayek and, and, his, uh, and his contemporaries, I mean, they, they feud. I mean, there's not, there's not one uh, specific narrow uh, conception of, of neoliberalism. There, there are all kinds of different people, some much more, I think, uh, distasteful to, to contemporary eyes than others. I mean, there, there's some very virulently, openly racist strands of, of, this, of this movement, um, which you know, I don't think it'd be fair to tar Hayek with. But I, I do think uh, that the, the, they are gen generally united by the idea that without, uh, without an upper class, to um, to create and transmit culture between gen generations, um, there cannot be uh, high culture or high levels of human achievement. So they genuinely believe in inequality as a goal in and of itself. And this is why they end up people like Hayek and Milton Friedman, who's one of his his sort of uh, most prominent disciples, I would say, though they have serious differences, particularly on economic policy, end up uh, end up advising Chilean dictator uh, Augusto Pinochet. Um, the idea that someone is a brutal dictator is not great to these guys, but they would rather see, I mean, Hayek is very explicit. He says he'd rather see uh, a dictator with what he calls liberal inclinations than a democracy without uh, liberalism. But the liberalism that he's talking about is, is not the liberalism of the Democratic Party in the 1960s or 1980s or even today. It's, it's, you know, things like social security. Uh, he thinks that these things are, are essentially uh, destructive to the public good and to the type of world that he wants to realize. By the 1970s... And just to be clear, I mean, this, Hayek, Hayek, go, go would, Hayek would refer to himself as a Dave Rubin liberal. That's it. <laughs> well, you know, there's That's this idea true. out there right now that there's this, this thing called classical liberalism, right. which... Is that the true thought of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and John Locke and these people? And that that vision is really uh, not a, a, a fair representation of of the views of of those liberals. Um, it's it's uh, it's the view of those liberals that that Friedrich Hayek and his disciples had. Right. Um, you know, if if you love individual liberty and religious freedom, I mean, John Locke wanted a state ban on Catholicism. So the idea that he represents the, the true form of, of uh, you know, libertarianism in the 21st century, uh, you know, that, that, that's very historically just kind of uh, silly per perspective. Um, but this is the, the type of thinking that gets, uh, that gets popularized by, by Hayek and his disciples in, in the middle of the 20th century while they're pursuing uh, you know, a lot of the ideas about property rights, for instance, that, that I think Locke would have found uh, quite compelling. So there's this big battle over what liberalism means in the 1940s between Keynes and, and, and Hayek. And Hayek is really a fringe player in that battle. He pretty much gets crushed during his lifetime uh, and people, people don't have a lot of, uh, there's just not a whole lot of respect for him outside of the sort of um, aristocratic fringe of American politics. In Europe, he's totally, um, he, he's totally sidelined. Uh, but after Keynes' death, uh, they start to get some momentum, particularly uh, in the 1960s when inflation starts to take off because Keynes becomes associated not so much with these political ideas but with the techniques that his disciples use to manage the economy. And when you start to have high levels of inflation, uh, this, this seems to be an economic problem that Keynes is not prepared for. There's all sorts of you know, complicated reasons why that I lay out in the book for, for why this, this comes to be seen as, as sort of central, as, a, as a, a devastating problem for Keynesian economics when I, I don't think it really was. Um, but because, of, because Keynesianism is, is thought to be incapable of grappling with this inflation problem, uh, Friedman, who's the disciple of Hayek, uh, sort of takes over and says, look, we, we, we can't have the state involved in these things. The state involvement in the economy is what is causing all of this inflation. We need to just step back and have economic management that's, that's about, about just maintaining an adequate supply of money for the economy and stop trying to regulate all of these other things 
stop trying to to change the amount of uh, of demand in the economy when it uh, when we slip into a recession. All that's doing is is building up inflation, and now we're we're sort of reaping the whirlwind of all these previous bad bad decisions. Uh, that becomes the, the the dominant view, and it stays the dominant view really until the uh, financial crisis of two thousand eight, when people see what uh, what unregulated financial markets can can do. Um, but the truth is, we saw what unregulated financial markets could do throughout this period. They just weren't happening in the United States. Uh, there were financial crises throughout the 80s and, and, and 90s that were devastating in other parts of the world. And the types of uh, Friedman-esque uh, austerity uh, regimes that were, that were prescribed to deal with it were, were terrible for, for the people who lived in these, in these countries and, and also terrible for international stability. They, they fueled ethnic conflict and all the things that, that you know, Keynes was worried that economic austerity could do. So uh, I think since 2008, there's been a very big shift. You, know, you don't have to be uh, a liberal or a progressive in, in sort of the American terminology to, to be a Keynesian anymore. Uh, I think there are a lot of people on the right who are convinced not only of the uh, economic wisdom of, of a lot of Keynesian thought, but of the political wisdom as well, uh, but there isn't a, a whole lot of room for expression of that idea in our politics because both parties, I think, in the United States at least, are still, they're still sort of, they don't know how to deal with new ideas and they've been sort of trained in this neoliberal school. So they, they're not, they, they, even when they want to do something new, they're not sure who to turn to. It's sort of like, like Joe Biden talking about how he wants to have a big Rooseveltian, uh, you know, aggressive, grandiose, uh, uh, economic program and then turning to somebody like Larry Summers, who's fought against that for his, his entire career. It's not that Biden, uh, you know, is, is he's not, he's not super confused about what he wants to do. I think he just doesn't know who else to turn to. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that throughout the world where there's, there, there are political leaders who are sort of born and bred in the neoliberal era who just don't know what to do now that that era uh, has has sort of come to a close, and 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 to be clear, the what what was it that you? Th I mean, uh, the inf inflation basically pushed Keynes out of the box, and in some respects, um, the the those who sort of carried on his legacy in the states, in some ways, um, uh, uh, took too many uh, were, were maybe too narrow in the way that they were um, uh, projecting. Keynesianism. So if, uh, and then, and then Clinton was the sort of the first, I think, Democrat, at least elected president who made that shift. And this was following obviously Reagan and Thatcher, um, which I think was sort of like when that shift really, really started to take hold. So um, I guess in the end, like what, what do you think if, If Joe Biden, and I will, I will take your premise, because um, I think it's plausible that he wants to have to do something more ambitious, but has no way of understanding even what that means in some respects. Um, uh, but well, let's say, you know, uh, you were able to create Keynes in some type of laboratory. I don't want to get too involved <laughs> in this, but I mean, look, you, you've written 600 pages on him. It's getting wild reviews. You have a very good sense of like, you know, um, hard to project where he would be if he was still alive in terms of like uh, his thinking. But if you were to take the essence of his philosophy, like what would you, uh, two questions. What, what, who would be the person you would want Joe Biden talking to? And what do you think that they would say? Well, look, I mean, Joe Biden should talk to me. Uh, that's obviously the person that I would want Joe Biden to talk to. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the, you know, there's, there, there are very few times in, uh, in each generation when ideas really do matter, when, when new thinking has the ability to change uh, the direction of the world. And I think we are in that moment right now. And I think we were in that moment in the 1960s as well, when, when Keynesianism sort of transformed from this, it is under the pressure of McCarthyism. So it's, it's not like these people were just, you know, totally venal, uh, you know, right wingers or something. I mean, there was a lot of pressure to to uh, 
there was a, there was a belief that maybe the, the ideas and the, the structure of thinking about the economy that Keynes developed would would completely go away. But but the, the idea of Keynesianism as this scientific, mathematical, precise project, I think, was very very devastating for it in the 1970s because you had people like Paul Samuelson who were interpreting Keynes and saying, look, we've looked at the data and it's very clear that you can't have inflation and unemployment at the same time. You have one or the other, and you can kind of manage the economy by having more unemployment or more inflation, but not both at the same time. So when you when you end up with both of them at the same time, it's devastating to the intellectual legitimacy of this project. I think by the time Clinton comes around, I don't necessarily think Bill Clinton is somebody who has sort of uh, died in the wool as, as a neoliberal. That's just the intellectual hegemonic uh, character of the times. It's, this is this is considered science by by. The, the economics profession, all of the experts are saying this is this is the way the world works. Um, and right now, all of the experts are kind of acknowledging they don't really know the way the world works. I mean, if you go back and, and read some of the stuff that Larry Summers has been saying, I mean, he's been trying to make up for uh, some of the more damaging aspects of his legacy, but he's he's saying you know everything that we did before was wrong, and and we have to come up with a new way of uh, of of approaching it. Um, you know, I think I think there are a lot of advisors to both the the Bernie Sanders and the Elizabeth Warren campaign, who uh, who have been thinking about the economy the way that John Maynard Keynes thought about it. Not that there were these hard and fast rules where you could guarantee certain mathematical results by implementing particular policies, but that there are a set of values and a type of society that you want to realize. And a set of sort of psychological conditions that you want to inculcate in society. And that if you attend to those psychological needs of your uh, democracy, then you will get results that, uh, that, that are, are much more prosperous, that people will, in fact, make more money and, and produce more stuff. Uh, that, that also corresponds with the international picture. Keynesianism is not just a, a domestic project of domestic prosperity. It's about international harmony and finding ways for different countries with, with frankly, different values to get along. And I think the relationship between the United States and China um, has, has not simply degraded. It's just never really made a whole lot of sense. And finding a way to, uh, I think, decoupling may be too strong a word, but finding a way to not keep escalating the conflict between these these two countries politically, while finding a way to economically for each country to take care of their own citizens, I think is uh, is a very serious project. And I don't I don't have you know clear uh, you know I have a you know twelve point program to to fix the relationship between the U.S. and China. But I think Keynes would have been able to say we need to have a harmonious way to exist together, and in order to do that, we need to take care. Of our people, and there are there are some some basic tools that the United States has never really implemented fully. You know, we don't have a functional healthcare system in the United States. The pandemic is laying that bare for all to see. But it was really clear before the pandemic uh, arose. Our social safety net is is porous and uh, stingy, and we we people do not have the support they need to embark on the creative kinds of lives. Uh, to take the risks, the entrepreneurial risks that we want to see people take to develop new ideas. And so our culture is, is not as, uh, as, as vibrant as it could be. And I think he would, tell, he would tell Biden to attend to the type of world you want to see, not to the deficit or to the, uh, the, 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 the accounting technicalities um, that we associate with economics. And so uh, basically, um, look at the world you want and then reverse engineer it on some level. But, so let me just ask you this. What, uh, lastly, what, what, why would he say, I have to ask this in this day and age, why would he say that socialism, and, and I know that's a fairly broad term, but what, 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 would his, what would his issue be with that as a process? I mean, because it sounds like, to a certain extent, Many of the things that we consider to be socialism today, from a, a policy prescription, he would have no issue with, right? Um, and it, so, it's a it's a very complicated word. It's just a very complicated word for Keynes. I mean, he was an anti-authoritarian, so he was this fierce critic of of the Stalinist regime in Russia. 
Uh, he would not want to see gulags and, and things like that. Um, he, he liked the idea of society being organized in such a way that people were able to realize a good life. So the policies that you need to organize that good life, you know, he would have been, he was fine with, with social security. He thought it was a great idea. There are people, including Milton Friedman, into uh, the 1990s who were saying that social security and progressive taxation were pure socialism. Right. Is that socialism? I mean, you know, most people today do not think progressive taxation and social security are socialism. Uh, but if it is, then Keynes is definitely a socialist, right? Does Keynes want every uh, industry in the country to be nationalized and to be put under the, the direct authority of the president? No, he would not want that. Um, so he would be thinking about how to create policies that engineer prosperity. He would not have been dogmatic about a particular way to organize prosperity. There are some regions where, uh, of the economy where, where markets make perfect sense, and there are others where they don't make any sense at all. I think healthcare is a really clear example of that one. But you know, he, he would not have been doctrinaire about this, uh, which, is, which is one of the problems with the idea of Keynesianism as an economic doctrine. He was a very versatile thinker. He could move on his feet, and he changed his mind several times over the course of his life. So uh, he would want society to address the problems of inequality and instability. He would, he would have found those to be uh, just disastrous. Um, and and he would, he'd see those as an emergency that, that needed to be addressed uh, with the same level of vigor and intensity that you would address you know, a foreign invasion in a war. Um, and and I think I, I think he would find it hard to understand why our politics look the way they do. Zach Carter, the book is The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. We will put a link to it at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much, and congratulations again on the book. Uh, it's getting uh, great reviews, and um, I uh, couldn't be happier for you. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much, Sam. All right, folks. We're going to take a um, quick break, come back with the fun half. Uh, joining us in the fun half, in fact, she'll be joining us in just a moment to tell us what's going on on, uh, on her show. We know McKee Const. Uh, she will be here in just a moment. In the meantime, let me remind you. Oh, and let me get, well, I may I'll wait for uh, McKee to come on. Uh, but uh, let me just uh, remind you that. Um, you can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, when you do, you get uh, not only the free show, but you get extra content almost every single day. On days when we don't do a show, you, maybe you get even better content because we go into the deep archives. Back when uh, Janine Garofalo and I hosted this program on uh, Air America Radio and when we used to get um, amazing guests in studio because it was terrestrial radio with millions of people listening. So um, you can check that out. Also, AM Quickie, uh, sign up for that. Totally free. Get uh, in your uh, box every day or your however you listen to your, your podcasts. Um, six or seven minutes of the daily news. Check out our merch shop. And don't forget um, the uh, Majority Report blend. You can get it at... Um, JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And uh, know me. Hi. Hi. So, nice what's happening on your show this week? <laughs> uh, what's happening on my show this week? We are talking about uh, the art of the smear and how ostracism was used, um, has been used to silence dissent um, in its roots back in like ancient Greece. Uh, what else are we talking about? We are, I, <laughs> I taped it like a week ago, so I can't even remember it now. Um, we have an interview, uh, with Lindsay Boylan, who is challenging representative Jerry Nadler. Uh, he has been there for over 30 years and he has only passed three pieces of legislation and they were vanity pieces of legislation. So, you know, the most unequal district in the country is the district that she is running, uh, oh, wow. to represent in New York. I mean, it's no surprise to us New Yorkers. Uh, so it's, it's a good show. We have, we're having a lot of fun on the show. I spoke to her a while back. I thought she was instrumental in pushing him to push for impeachment too. Yeah. Uh, her inclusion in the race. And also uh, tonight is Tuesday. 
That means it's the Michael Brooks show. And you can check that out at patreon.com slash TMBS or on YouTube, the Michael Brooks show. Matt, who's on tonight? Do you know? Uh, I do not have the rundown yet. So no, but uh, be a surprise, folks. Check, out, Matt, check it out. I actually know who will be on TMBS tonight because oh, really? I was going to book this guest for the majority report. It's <laughs> Dustin uh, Guastella. Oh, Guastella. oh, yeah. Guastella. Yeah, cool. Yeah, he's a good guest. He's, uh, he? he's a union guy, uh, Teamsters, I believe. Um, in you know, Philadelphia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and we've had him on before, but he's a great guest, actually. We should have him on Majority Report, definitely. All right, great. There we well, go. And uh, folks, uh, check it out. Um, also, don't forget, check out uh, The Antifada, patreon.com slash The Antifada. A lot of new content. They're pumping out a ton of content every uh, every week. Uh, Matt, what's happening uh Literary hangover. Yesterday, in lieu of the majority report, I did. I Twitch streamed over at twitch.tv slash literary hangover, played some Red Dead Redemption, mm. and learned about the uh, frontier of the mythology of the metropolis from 1820 to 1845 and the emergence of the plantation and factory at that time, um, or just how they developed kind of in tandem. So, uh, twitch.tv slash literary hangover, folks. I, I still don't like, I just like imagine someone listening to this program for the first time. And hearing what you're saying and being completely confused. And I have to say, even if you've been he- listening to uh, you uh, pitch that Twitch stream every day, I feel like people would be like, like, what? Wait, what? It's playing. A- what? Uh, folks, and, 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 and Nomi, maybe we'll talk about this in the uh, fun half. We really have to uh, deal with the elephant in the room here, obviously. Um, there's a lot of issues surrounding my mustache that, uh, we better talk about in the fun half. Um, it's like, whoa. <laughs> there's been, yeah, there's been, it's, it's highly controversial. It's probably, I think Mike Cernovich and the mustache, so. <laughs> the two, uh, times where I have, um, where, you know, uh, search terms on Google have gone up for me. Uh, I would say. Oh, Wow. I'm people checking. are literally I, I searching. You I, went on I, cable I though, right? You went on MSNBC with it? I did. I, I was probably the first person on MSNBC in a long time, a uh, contributor who, w- with a mustache. Um, and, I don't um, know, Thomas Friedman, come on. Oh, that's true. Oy. That's a Thomas Oy. Friedman mustache. I think no, you look like a Jewish Mario brother. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Thank you. I get a lot of that. Uh, Serpico, there's a whole, there's a whole. Serpico is nice. I know, I know oh Serpico is not a uh, Jewish Mario brother. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, 646-257-3920 is the number. 646-257-3920 is the number. See you in the fun half. We'll also take IMs on the app. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> good shit exactly i'm happy now it's a win-win it's a win 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 oh hell yeah now listen to me two three four five times eight four seven nine oh six five oh one four five seven two thirty eight fifty six twenty seven one half five eights three point nine billion wow he's the ultimate math nerd don't you see why don't you get a real job instead of stewing vitriol and hatred you left wing limbaugh everybody's taking their dumb juice today come on sammy dance 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 my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, gonna take a quick break. 
I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. <laughs> I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. You guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Uh, Nomi, I hope things are going well for you uh, yeah. uh, uh, down there in Arizona. It's getting a little Settling hot. Settling in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to go back to my apartment though. And I'm trying to figure out the logistics there. Cause like, is it safe to fly? I mean, I, I still can't figure this out. So my understanding makes- about what's happening now on the airlines is that they have cut back a lot of the flights. So they're packing people right. in and uh, which of course is not what you would want to do. Right. Um, in this type of situation. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, my friend just flew and granted it was international, but it just, it makes you think a little bit about this, like coming off of a flight. So she flew to Greece to see her mother and uh, they put her, she's already had COVID in America. She had COVID. She got through it. She has her antibodies test. They took her off the plane, which was, you know, very, uh, maybe like a quarter full, maybe even a sixth full. And they put her in a, in a hotel for one day until she got the test back. And they're like, you're negative. She's like, yeah, I know. I had COVID. And then they forced them into quarantine for two weeks and they have to check in on them. It's crazy. Um, um, I, I, I know my sister is planning on, uh, on coming cross country um, in, I, I don't know, a month or so. And before she goes to see uh, our parents, she is going to self-quarantine for 14 days just to be safe yeah um i you know i would get one of those uh shields face shields oh the blood the class yeah yeah and also the mask and then maybe you know that's do the gloves help i've been reading stuff lately like it may not actually help to have gloves makes me feel better (laughs) i mean it doesn't i i I think they're certainly not going to hurt uh, but I think there's a sense that unless somebody has just sneezed on something, um, you know, literally seconds before you touch it and go to your mouth with it, that surfaces aren't um, as big of a deal. In fact, the epidemiologist, the last, I can't remember, uh, Brendan, I never get his name right, so you can remind me, but the last epidemiologist we had on, uh, I had asked him, what were the, um, what were the, 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 the transmission, what were the main vehicles for transmission? And he said, there's three air, air, and air. Yeah. Um, and right. so I think that we're starting to, to get that notion, but we, you know, we don't, we don't know, but um, so let's, um, let's, let's talk about this for a moment because this is, um, you know, w- w- the, the, w- people are, Society is slowed down right now in the context of our society, but there's some problems that are um, that have a, a durability and a resonance that exist even in these contexts. Here's video. It is taken by a, a guy. This is in uh, Central Park in New York City. Oh my God. The video is taken by a, a guy named Christian Cooper, and he is a birder, right? There's a, there, apparently, there's a lot of birds around now for whatever reason i think there's less pollution no but i'm not quite sure if it's tied to anything about what's happening in society or it's just like some years there's more birds but uh there's a lot of birders in new york you know you go into central park and they they look at uh at different birds that's that's okay and um <laughs> I love how you're like that's okay <laughs> yeah they're yeah, just not, birds they're not staring at anything else no but i'm saying that's not like um you know 
it's 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 it's, it's, it's a pastime. Yeah, sure. It's better than shooting them. It's definitely better than shooting them. Yeah. And uh, so there's a place in Central Park called the Ramble, and the Ramble is like I guess like a a bird. I don't know if it's a sanctuary or what specific sanctuary, but that's like the area where people go birding, and you're supposed to keep your dogs on a leash because dogs and birds don't mix. If you have a bird, if you have a dog, you know that they will go after birds occasionally. And uh, so there's uh, Christian Cooper's in there. He sees a woman. Her name is Amy Cooper. No relationship, no relation at all. Uh, apparently, though, this Amy Cooper has been going around, has, you know, often seen in the ramble with her dog off a leash. And so he said, could you please put a leash on your dog? And then this ensues. Would you please stop? Sir, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording. Please, please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to and me. I'm taking a picture of calling the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Oh, my God. Excuse me? It's for a dog. Yeah, look at the dog. He's just, just like hitting him. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I'm in the ramble, and there is a man, African-American, who has a bicycle helmet. He is recording me and threatening me and my dog. There is an African-American man, I am in Central Park, he is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. Oh my god, this dog! I can't, man, I can't watch. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the ramble. I don't know. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, and it, it, no, notice what he does. Thank you after she puts the the leash on the dog now this is um there's so many societal problems just within the confines of that video but also it turns out this amy cooper is what what is her job brendan he works at uh franklin templeton investments as she has a, a very convoluted title, but I'll pull that up right now. She is the oh, head of Franklin Templeton Insurance Investment Solutions. Okay, so she there's a lot of people, I think a, a significant number of people seem to be working under her and, and, and she's making all sorts of uh, advisory things. And the, the point being that she immediately, I mean, it's not, there's somebody there who's threatening me, right? Right? Because that's like, okay, she's just um, being, you know, uh, a loon and she's upset that she got caught uh, with her dog off the leash. The guy is not moving near her. In fact, he's saying, don't come near me. Right, right. Because right, right. I don't want to get coronavirus. Yeah. So there's no l real threat. I mean, it's quite clear. If that is the end of the like escalation, as it were, there's obviously no threat. Uh, she knows this, but she also knows that as a white woman in Central Park, she can leverage the fact that he is uh, black. And, 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 and if like in the last time that she talks, she's like talking almost as if she's literally being attacked. Yes, her voice was amplifying. Yes. Like, yes. I, She's this nuts. Is, She's got to be like. Performance. It's totally it's performance. performance. It's a and, narcissistic. Yeah. And if she knows this in that moment and leverages this, like, what is she doing in the course of her job in one of these big financial uh, outlets? Like, what is she doing in the rest of her life? I mean, what is she doing that she what what circles does she live in and work in right. that she knows that this is being videotaped and she's doing this and she's calling in to 911 in this situation like 
how much of her life experience tells her what her privilege is and what what his is not and what she's she can get away with. conscious of it. That's what's so crazy. She's manipulating the fact that she's conscious of her privilege. It's not like, I mean, not that there's ever justification for this, but it's it's like she's so aware of what she's doing and how the NYPD is going to respond in Central Park and exacerbating it with her voice that it's all a manipulation. It's like a sociopathic manipulation of the situation. Well, I it mean, is do we know what nuts. happened? Do we know if the cops arrived? If this guy... Uh, I don't know if they arrived. I do know this, that she is on now CNN since yeah. the video came out saying that her life is being ruined. Contemplate what happens if the cops show up right. um, thinking that a woman is being attacked in Central Park. Like, what could happen to this guy? And the idea that she's complaining about her life right. being ruined, she did everything she could to put this guy's, not only ruin his life, but to, I mean, a legitimate potential to end his life. Like, I'm being Perhaps attacked. A leash. A leash. I, I, she's in a mood and she doesn't want to deal with it. Yeah, it's murder by proxy. It's right. your attempted murder by proxy. I I, it is so, uh, I mean, this is like, it's, it's like you swatting. It's like you swatting, but worse. Oh, I, I mean, I think she's, I think she's going to have criminal charges pressed against her because you can't, you can't, you can't just use the police as your personal conflict resolution thing right. by pretending you're being attacked. There is no definition of the word attacked where you could apply it to that situation. Um, and, and then, you know, the bottom line is for black people, I would imagine particularly black males going through life, like this is an implicit threat in all of these situations that that white person might do it. I mean, this goes back, you know, this is like, this is the, the lynching dynamic. Yes. I don't like what you're doing here. And so I'm going to use the authorities to come and get you. Right. Right. And you can't so breathe. You cannot breathe. You can't be in presence. You can't speak out of fear of, of she's in a testy mood and she's, she wants to use this dynamic against him. I mean, what's really frustrating about this is it's like, there's all this reporting right now. She's so manipulative. She clearly understands Obviously, the NYPD has a racist history, but especially right now during Corona, they're targeting black and brown communities, targeting people in ways that white communities are not being targeted for, for social distancing violations, for not wearing masks, whatever you know the rules are right now in the city. And de Blasio is under pressure. So I think like if, if, if there's a way to flip this story, I think it's to flip the pressure back on de Blasio to address these issues. Because meanwhile, you have... You have privileged white racists in the city that exists that are using it to for their own benefit. Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, I, I just that was nuts. Um, I, I I hope that um, I I mean I hope that she she faces criminal charges on that. Yeah, um, sanctuary, unreal, uh, unbelievable. I mean, totally believable, but still shocking. I guess is really the best way to say that. Um, let's go to the phones. Calling from a 210 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam. This is John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. How are you? I'm good. Good. Ten states will have, their down, have hey, already John, had their John, down ballot hey, John, election so John, far. For John, the John, will you do me one favor? I'm sorry, buddy. We have uh, some technical limitations. Will you... Just back off the phone just a little bit. Okay. Is that better? Oh, that's much better. Okay. So, so 10 states have had their down ballot election so far for the U.S. Uh, House and Senate. So next Tuesday, June 2nd, eight more states will have their primaries. Uh, four brand new Congress endorsed candidates are running. Uh, in Maryland, 5th uh, District, Michaela Wilkes, who you interviewed, on September 27th of last year is running against one of the worst corporate Democrats in the House, Steny Hoyer, who is the House Majority Leader's second highest position 
below the Speaker of the House. Uh, Wilkes has raised almost $300,000. And in the 4th District of Maryland, Sheila Bryant is challenging uh, centrist Anthony uh, Brown, who endorsed Pete Buttigieg. So it gives you a sense of where, where he's coming from. In Indiana's 1st District, uh, where Democratic incumbent Peter Visklowski is retiring, Jim Harper is running ag against 11 other Democrats. Harper's raised $212,000, which puts them fifth in fundraising. And in Iowa, uh, Senate race, Kim Kimberly Graham has raised over $255,000, which puts her fourth in, in fundraising among Democrats. Unfortunately, the favorite, Teresa Greenfield, who was just endorsed, uh, who was endorsed by the Democratic uh, Senatorial Campaign Committee has raised over $7 million and was just endorsed by Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last poll, uh, Greenfield was at 43%, while Graham is only at 4%. So while the odds seem daunting, I encourage yeah. listeners who, who to vote for the candidates who endorse uh, Medicare for All, at least a 15 an hour uh, minimum wage, Green New Deal, social justice, and a more peace-oriented foreign policy. Uh, Pat Hackett is the favorite in Indiana's second district. She supports Medicare for All and is running against Ellen Marks. In 2018, Republican Jackie Wol Wolarski won by only 10 points in the general election, and that, that election could be a, a competitive. And in New Mexico's third district, which represents the northern part of the state, where uh, Ben Ray Lujan is running for the Senate, Teresa Legere, who's raised over $1.2 uh, million dollars uh, and has the second highest uh, fundraising total. And she only trails the Valerie Plain, who has raised over $2 oh million dollars and who is the favorite. Uh, like Valerie Plain. What Plain. world are we in right now? Right. Yeah. Plain. Well, uh, John, I appreciate the update. Um, let us know how uh, all this goes. This, and this, is, this election is a week from today? Yeah, it's, it's a week from today. So, so, you know, I just encourage, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of complaints about the Democrats and it's all super well founded, but I mean, this is the time, you know, this is the time right now to vote for these uh, progressive, you know, left candidates. Uh, so, you know, after Tuesday, we'll have, you know, 18 out of the 50 states will have voted. So it's very important that, that you vote for these candidates. Also, can I mention one thing about, yeah. you know, I've been talking a little bit about the these rulings that are coming about actually voting in Texas, you know, whether you have to vote in person for COVID. The last time I talked, we had, we had uh, you know, the Democratic Party uh, put, put uh, cases in both the, the state and the federal courts. And the first courts, you know, said that, that they, they should be able to vote. The, the state, Texas State Supreme Court said, no, you're not going to be able to vote. Then the federal court here in San Antonio said, yes, you should be able to vote. And then the, the I think it's the Fifth Circuit overturned it. So right now, things aren't looking too good. I mean, there's a stay for it right now. And I just want to rem remind people what the 26th uh, Amendment to the to the uh, to the Constitution says, it says the rights of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of old, and this is when it was changed from 21 to 18 or older, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of this age. So, I mean, what they're doing by saying that you have to be 65 or older is an abridgment of the, of the 26th Amendment. And that's what uh, Judge Fred Beery said here in America. And that is the right ruling. It is, it is a, a, you know, a ridiculous idea that, that I'm going to have to actually go in person to vote in the runoff on July 15th and possibly in the general election. Even these other Republican states, you know, I was talking about this, the six main states, most of them, uh, the six swing states, you can vote by mail. And it, it is just so ridiculous that I actually have to contemplate voting in person here in Texas. It's outrageous. Right. right. And, and, you know, you have people like yourself who are caring for uh, elderly parents and, um, and you, you're necessarily putting them at, uh, on some level of, of risk that is completely unnecessary. That's, that's totally right. I mean, well, John, I appreciate, so, the, I pr appreciate the call. Good luck. Um, hang on. All, right. all right. Bye-bye. Thank uh, you. It's, 
it's nuts. I mean, and, and, you know, one of the things that we started doing around here, Nomi, is we get rulings now, and this is something that I only started to really do over the past three or four years because, um, it just wasn't as a dramatic divide. I mean, George W. Bush, uh, there, it, it, it was in many respects, but uh, it's when it really started in, in many respects. But you look at uh, this ruling came out of Florida. People know the uh, Florida story where um, the voters of Florida voted by referendum to add an amendment to the uh, Constitution, I believe. The Florida Constitution that said uh, convicted felons who have served their time and are now out of prison, they have their voting rights restored. Right. right. They've served, uh, they have, you know, they have done what society has demanded of them right. in terms of uh, serving their time. They come out, their voting rights are restored. That doesn't seem terribly. Um, uh, you know, revolutionary in any way to me. This is 2018, uh, right? Yes. And the Republican legislature tries about four or five different ways to undo this. The last one that they did was basically say, your vote will not be restored until you have paid off all fees and costs incurred by the government to try you and to uh, imprison you. Now, there is no system in Florida. There's no way to go online, let's say, and look like, do I owe money? Right. Like they, you know, this is not something that they have in any way sort of contemplated in the past. It is obviously a way to inhibit um, these folks from exercising their right. And a federal uh, judge... Robert Hinkle of the district court in Tallahassee, and we'll go to an appeals court, I bet, after this, uh, wrote that by conditioning felons voting rights to fees that fund the routine operations of the criminal justice system, it effectively creates a tax by any other name. And the I think it's the 24th Amendment of the Constitution. Um, I believe it's the 24th. If it's not, I forgive me. Uh, says that you cannot institute a poll tax mm -hmm. on uh, voters. And so the judge granted a permanent injunction to civil rights groups that challenged the law as discriminatory for the majority of felons. Apparently, many of those folks are indigent. Um, like I say, the state's going to appeal. And But much of Sunday's ruling is built on a previous ruling by the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit in Atlanta, which would hear any appeal. So there's good reason to believe, but again, you don't know who, which uh, judges, but this judge is a Clinton appointed judge, hmm. right? And now I don't think Clinton appointed the best crop of judges. And certainly Obama um, had a similar problem. There's a lot of corporate uh, of folks in there, but when you start talking about like basic tenets of democracy um, and I don't know how you would call this anything but a dirty tricks. I mean, look, the, the, the judge, I mean, the judge said this, which I think is really uh, accurate. Surely very few, because the, those who were uh, the defense in this instance, this is the uh, GOP legislature was saying like, well, when, when Florida voters went to vote, surely they knew that a lot of these um, felons had outstanding fees uh, that the government paid for and that they should pay them back. And the judge was like, uh, no, surely very few Florida voters knew that every Florida felony conviction results in an order to pay hundreds of dollars in fees and costs intended to fund the government, even when the judge does not choose and choose to impose a fine as part of the punishment and there is no victim uh, to whom restitution is owed. So apparently it's just like pro forma wow. and um, the idea that your debt of this nature would keep you from voting is just unbelievable. So hopefully the appeals court um, will fast track this and this will be the case for the, for the, um, the fall election. But 
another example of just like so insane. the import of federal judges, Mitch McConnell, right. Donald Trump have been able to put, I think it's, I don't know, maybe close to 200 now in the course of his three years, three and a little bit more um, of, of his presidency, the implications are going to be huge, uh, particularly with cases like that. I should start a website. Biden sucks, but this is one one more thing you could add to the list that you most likely will not get 200 more right wing, clearly right wing judges. Maybe corporate, crazy ass right, right yeah, wing. Yeah, like we're talking crazy ass nutcases, and they're they're looking for the young ones too. Yes, they're getting very sophisticated about that. Mm-hmm. Um, do you remember Cheryl Atkinson? She was the CBS reporter who was convinced yes, that like yes, she was yes, tweeting stuff yes, like, and I can't yes. remember exactly what it was, but the gist of it was the Obama administration is like bugging my computer right. because uh, this whole Benghazi thing is gonna is gonna be huge, and um, so she landed on her feet at Sinclair Media, uh, naturally, and of the um, lo- basically like the local version of Fox. These are the people who put the Swift boat. Uh, uh, documentary powerful because it's like all local media is owned by Sinclair now and people don't realize it they don't realize it. they Not also I think did the um, the Clinton cash uh, video oh, yeah, I think yeah, they yeah. played that well anyways she's got her own show now and of course she interviews the president and uh, part of a full measure that's the name of her show <laughs> and uh, Donald Trump has the ability to um he is now talking, and this I think represents a little bit of a twist. Remember, like last week, it was Obamagate, it was a huge scandal brewing, but somehow Trump has already been able to defeat it. I still don't understand what it is. But what am I doing? I'm fighting the deep state. I'm fighting. Uh, I'm fighting the swamp, and I said I was doing it, and I'm exposing the swamp. I think. If it keeps going the way I'm going, and Ratcliffe is fantastic, if it keeps going the way it's going, I have a chance to break the deep state. It's a vicious group of people. It's very bad for our country. And that's never happened before. You have. No one's ever been able to break the deep state. Never. There's, um, this, there's this new book about this. I forgot what the reporter's name is. I'll look it up in a second. Um, about how the right wing basically took the idea of the deep state from the left and because you know we're it's about the military industrial complex on the left and and it was again back to bannon like it was a bannon decision to make this a central theme of of his candidacy so all these 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 it was like whatever the version of bureaucracy was for the bush administration they've taken it to another level with the deep state this is right they made it yeah is this uh david road you're thinking of I think so. Let me let me check my podcasts because I listened to it the other day. They um, they have basically melded this notion of yes. a, a, a a sort of consistent structural. Uh, some people call it the blob, as it were, um, particularly in terms of like um, national security issues and and foreign policy, but like the existing uh, bureaucracy, the existing like sort of um, institutional memories, and they tr- they've basically turned it into some type of like mm-hmm. updated version of the Bilderberger Group, right. and um, <laughs> where you know they're meeting in their, you know uh, they're they're meeting out in the woods and, and banging drums and figuring out how they're going to take out Donald Trump. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't help that you have like members of the FBI, former members of of the CIA, who are on Twitter you know, challenging Trump, you know, they're not political figures. They're just angry that Trump is, is dismissing intelligence, just, you know, uh, not understanding, you know, the process or, or the law or whatever it is that they're complaining about based on the day of the week, but it doesn't help to have that narrative, that back and forth. It plays. Uh, right. I, into- I, I, I agree. I mean, I think most of those people who are doing it are doing it for self-interested mm-hmm. uh, reasons. Um, I think, you know, obviously uh, if there was a deep state, these folks, they would tell these folks like, hey, knock it off. Right. Let's get somebody Twitter. else to do this. Right? It's a little bit obvious. <laughs> it's actually us, Sam. People well, I mean, that's it. that's what if, if I was the deep state, that's what I would do. Get get don't get 
CIA people to to, right. to represent your interests. Don't run on Twitter claim for Congress. Right. <laughs> Be a little bit, you know, sophisticated about this. Here is uh, this is also another. This is very interesting too. The um, it appears now the way they're going to deal with Obamagate. We saw this last week, right? Where um, Bill Barr announced that I don't anticipate any charges to be leveled against Joe Biden or Barack Obama involved in the Durham investigation, even if they did anything wrong, which is like, you know, the sort of, I don't know, it's like a humble brag, right? A little bit. It's like, um, I'm not the one who's going to ever say anything about how that person hit their wife. I'm never going to say it. Um, this is this is Bill Barr basically saying we have nothing on them. And so we're going to be magnanimous and not charge them, even though we have a lot of stuff on them. And it, it appears that Bill Barr's strategy has now been adopted by the rest of the White House. Uh, it means because what they're doing now is uh, they're having own, oh, you know, One America Network, which is partially owned by one of the Trump guys, kids now, right? Um, and uh, spe speculation of, of a takeover by the Trump family. And Trump himself has been pushing this network. Uh, they're, at, they're basically given a question that you know was pre-planned to make Trump look like he's magnanimous and that there's something that they have found that Obama was up to. Considered pardoning President Obama for illegally wiretapping on Trump towers, illegally spying on U.S. citizens, and other potential potential crimes out there. Has he considered that? So I have not spoken to the president Pause about it for that. One second. Um, Here's the question: Has President Trump considered pardoning Barack Obama for all the crimes he committed against him? Right? Has he considered pardoning him? Like being born in Kenya. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah we've already skipped, right. Did you consider pardoning him for not being an American and being president and Violating also being the black? Constitution? Yeah. <laughs> I have not spoken to the president about that, um, but who I did speak to about President Obama and unmasking Michael Flynn were the men and women in this room. Um, I haven't spoken to him on that specific point, have spoken to him about the matter generally. And I laid out a series of questions that any good journalist would want to answer about why people were unmasked um, and, and all sorts of questions. And I just wanted to follow up with you guys on that. Did anyone take it upon themselves to pose any questions about Michael Flynn and un unmasking the President Obama spokesperson? Oh, not a single journalist has posed but, that but, question. But, but, okay. But name wasn't so I would so like Kelly, to Kelly. lay out a series of questions, and perhaps if I write them out in a slide format, maybe we're visual learn learners and you guys will follow up with journalistic curiosity. So number one, why did the Obama administration use opposition, opposition research funded by a political organization and filled with foreign dirt to surveil members of the Trump campaign? Number two, why was Lieutenant... General Michael Flynn unmasked, not by the intel community entirely, but by Obama's chief of staff, by the former vice president, Joe Biden, by Susan Rice, by the Treasury secretary. I mean, this is extraordinary. And, you know, if it were political appointees in the Trump administration, I can guarantee you I'd have questions in my inbox right now. But apparently Obama's spokesperson does not. Why was Flynn's identity leaked in a criminal now, act? It is second. a criminal. I just, I just wanted to say, um, that A, Flynn's name was never masked. They didn't unmask it. The report, it, it was, everybody could see it. It was, there was no reason to unmask it. I mean, because it was not masked. And also uh, the reason why they're not getting in touch with President Obama's uh, spokesperson is because <laughs> he's not president anymore. I know, it's insane. But uh, but she's got uh, she's, she had these slides. She was ready for this question. Like you asked the question about whether uh, Trump is going to pardon him, which implies that he did something criminal. And I'll follow it up with this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Is there anything more wa worth watching here, Brendan? No, not really. She ends the press conference after, uh, you know, ask, posing more slides. Oh, so it's a, it's one of those like, here's the final question yeah. you're going to ask. Am I going to pardon 
to make it look like I'm, I'm actually a big guy thinking about it. This I mean, do, do you think this is working right now? Or do you, th- do you feel like this is sort of the death knell and that they're, you know, they're thrashing? It seems like mental jiu-jitsu. I mean, I, could, I like, I can't keep up with it. And I definitely, if I can't keep up with it, I can't, what, what person, what Rust Belt person that they're trying to win over right now is going to be able to keep up with it. Yeah, uh, let me ask you this, Naomi. I mean, do you? I, I, I mean, never mind the fact that it's ineffective. Like, do you think this is like a? Do you think this is just Trump sitting there going like, I want full all hands on deck about this, and people are just like, oh, all right. I mean, Maybe. what like what like what is the strategy here? I think I mean the only strategy I can think of is just pound some sort of doubt about Obama. And it may not make any sense. They don't have, there's there's no mapping, there's no chart, but somebody did a PowerPoint res, uh, presentation to make it sound like it's real and official. And and like, that's enough of a, of, of a, I mean, it's like putting forth a book report and it has, you, all of your sourcing is like your friend's other book report. But, but how does this work? So if they debate, they get out there and Trump goes, how could you work? for a man who was engaged in Obamagate, Joe Biden. <laughs> and Biden's like, I, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, well, right. the unmasking of Flynn. And uh, Biden would be like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, see, everybody? Like he worked no, for the that's guy. That's exactly unmasked how it's going like, to work, yeah. I, but and I mean, like, like and I, I just, it just seems like a very odd strategy to me. I mean, it's Benghazi. Um, it's it's another form of Benghazi, but tying it to Obama, and that's that's all it is. It's I mean, Benghazi is a real event, obviously, but it, it's taking the Benghazi something- thing. They didn't even use against uh, Clinton. It that's was well, the emails that came out of the Benghazi thing, and I guess maybe they're hoping that they're going to get something that comes out that is like, wait a second. In the course of the unmasking, it was clear Joe Biden had a server, a secret server. I just don't think there's <laughs> enough material there. And, you know, I'm looking today, there's like competing stories here, right? There's one story that the economy is going to go in a V shape. You know, the difference between the V recovery and the U recovery. Uh, The V recovery is like, there's going to be a day in September where all of a sudden, like everybody comes back to work and we're, the growth is going to be crazy in the, in September and October the economy is going to, you know, not totally recover, but like half recover. And Trump is going to go around triumphal. I've, I've got this. Uh, I've been a great on the economy. I think people still the polling looks like um, broadly people trust Trump on the economy more than Biden in some way. Um, and that this is the sort of like nightmare scenario for the for the Democrats, because I mean, let's face it, Joe Biden is not necessarily perfectly situated to uh, deal with a campaign that involves him being super proactive, right? And super active. He's much better off, like just, this is a referendum on Trump. But if things improve a little bit, maybe that changes the calculation that that referendum is not so much of a slam dunk. I mean, we saw what happened at the end of last week when uh, Biden went out there and um, and uh, we'll talk about this, you know, tried to get out there and mix it up with Charlemagne the God. But um, what what is your take on this? And the, on the other hand, I'm looking at like polling that shows that Trump is um, I don't know if cratering is the right word, but maybe with Americans over the age of 65, because it turns out that People over the age of 65, I would imagine any age cohort, is not excited to have uh, a message coming from a specific political party that, like, you're dispensable uh, and we're not going to ruin our time here by protecting the remaining amount of time you have. Well, I want to see the breakdowns on that. I mean, is it those over 65 in blue states or those over 65 in swing states or 44 battleground house districts? Okay. Done by a Democratic pollster, to be fair, Jeff Garen. I don't know anything about him. You might know. I don't know. Uh, During the second week of May. Okay. In those districts, 
Voters over 65 said they had supported Trump in 2016 by a 22 percent margin. 58 to 36 percent. This year, those same respondents. 47 percent saying they're planning to vote for Trump, 43 percent. Saying they're planning to vote for Joe Biden. That's That's a a problem for them. 18 percentage points to swing in battleground house districts. Yeah. Well, so these are the, the, and and let's be clear here these are the same voters. This is not like new voters that are coming out in these battleground districts where presumably we saw in 2018 they tend to be Democratic. I mean, if, if, if we follow 2018, these are new, these are the same voters. Right. That's, a big well, problem, if that's is, right. This is sort of the 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 conundrum that they have. It's that for every person they're trying to win over by keeping unemployment down, by opening up the economy in red states, they're losing a, a segment of voters that are just scared for their lives. Yep. It is. And Joe Biden just sits on the sidelines doing nothing. <laughs> like, I mean, literally, like, that's it. I, you know, if I'm Joe Biden's campaign um, person, that's what I'm telling him to do. Yeah. In fact, I would say, um, I would say, you know, yeah, sit on the sidelines because you got nothing else. Yeah. Really. So they're, doing, they're, they're doing a couple of things. They're trying to sow doubt in the Obama administration by putting out crazy conspiracy theories that don't even have like, there's no like streamline storyline, whatever it is um, that they're trying to push out. They're suppressing votes like always. They're pushing the economies to open up, hoping for some sort of slight economic recovery in time for him to champion and say that he defeated Corona. And then China. I mean, China is is going to be repeated over and over and over and wait for that part of the Obama attacks in blaming, as he already is, but but taking it to another level of all the jobs that were lost were, were Obama's fault. And the trade deals with China were Obama's fault. And where was Joe Biden during this time period? He was, and there's tons of footage of him campaigning for the TPP, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, but the, the TPP was, uh, you know, it's unpopular, but it was the rationale. And I don't know if I buy it, but the rationale was to get there first and box right. out China. Um, and I, I just think that like that stuff is just not that I, I just don't, I don't see how that suppresses votes. I, I just don't think that there is a large contingency of people out there going like, I would vote for Joe Biden, but I heard this stuff about, about, um, about, you know, trade, you know, China. And I don't I'm think it not- suppresses votes. I think that that reminds whatever voters that they're trying to win in Michigan and Wisconsin about why they're in this economic crisis. And, 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 and if he can somehow say, uh, the economy was was on an uptick already. Then we had coronavirus. I solved it. We're in a better situation now. Look at if the Obama administration had handled this, you know, we would have had ec- the economic recovery that they put forward took 10 years and we never recovered. Right. I did it in two months. Right. Well, I will say this, that I think one of the problems that, you know, I mean, uh, the, I don't think the Trump people have figured out a way to suppress Biden supporters, right? Like they're not going to convince, I think, uh, you know, Biden voters to vote Trump. I think, um, you know, to the extent that that happened, that would have been Obama to Trump voters. And I have a feeling some of those Obama to Trump voters were like, I guess I was wrong. You know, like, I don't want yeah. two non-normal presidents in a row. Right. I'm not having a black guy and then a woman. We need to go back to a white guy. Like, I, I don't know how many of those people are represented in those figures, but I would think that it's some. Um, I think the real question is, do they have the ability to people keep people coming out in certain states to vote for Joe Biden. I don't know that the Trump people have that ability. Joe Biden might. And let's play this clip. I, I was on uh, Hayes and I didn't get to this point uh, really on Friday when we we're talking about Biden's appearance on with uh, Charlemagne the God, uh, the Breakfast Club. It's a radio show. Uh, maybe I don't know if it's the most popular radio show morning show uh, in terms of black audience, but I think so. And um, uh, folks I've talked to over the weekend are, are the, the people are getting a little bit like annoyed at how, how like 
confident Joe Biden is when it comes to the African American vote. Like, and um, this. Let's play this clip. Do we, does the clip include um, any of uh, of Charlemagne? What that exchange? No, this is just your. Uh, okay. Response. Well, the exchange goes like this. Charlemagne says, "You know, um, I, I can't remember what Charlemagne says that 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 inspires Biden to say, hey, if you're thinking of voting for Trump over me, you ain't black." Now he was sort of he was joking. He was obviously not telling Charlemagne that he's not black. But he was, it was like, that's how confident I am. And then Charlemagne's like, well, wait a second. And he goes, I, you know, uh, I, I reauthorized the Voting Rights Act uh, 20 times over the course of 20 years. And um, I got endorsed by the NAACP, uh, you know, six times or whatever it was. And Charlemagne says, well, I, w- I want something to bring back to my community. And that part, that part is the most revealing part about this exchange in my mind. Here's uh, what I said on Hayes. And I also just, um, if you're at work, just be careful because my mustache really pops on this. So. Well, I, you know, what I was also <laughs> struck was by Charlemagne's uh, uh, follow-up, which is I, I want something material yeah. to bring back to my community. And Joe Biden had no answer for that. I mean, he said, you know, I've I've uh, authorized the the Voting Rights Act. Well, I mean, let's be honest, every single senator in 2006 or seven, I mean, except for maybe four. And I'm so I'm including the vast majority of Republicans also reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. That's not a terribly that should be a baseline. Uh, never mind for a Democratic senator, any senator for that matter. And so uh, right, the fact that there. he couldn't respond. Um, we don't need I mean, the, the, the real problem is that Joe Biden can't come out and say, Here's my policy, and he may have some, I don't know, but here are my policy prescriptions that are actually like a reason to vote for me that isn't a referendum on Donald Trump. And I I mean, without a doubt, if Joe Biden wins, it's going to be because it's a referendum on Donald Trump. But if Joe Biden Biden loses, it's going to be because he could not get enough people to come out and vote from him in key states and particularly key constituencies like African-American voters who are maybe the key constituency for uh, a Joe Biden win. And he's, he should be in that moment instead of saying like, Hey, it's me or Donald Trump, take it or leave it. Which I look, I think is a a compelling rationale. I get that, but I, I can say that, but I'm not the candidate. I don't have the ability to say, well, wait a second. We're going to do X. We're going to do Y. We're going to do Z. These are crucially needed by the African American community. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going, I mean, he doesn't. He's not bringing any of that. Well, I think what's so so great about what Charlemagne's doing is he's doing what all of us are trying to get other constituent constituent constituency groups to do. You know, feminists aren't set. They're just sitting on the sidelines. They're quiet. They're not saying, "Listen, okay, you want to pick a female VP." change your committee that's your selection committee right listen these are the things they're just sitting on the sidelines so you know thank god he he actually had key key uh negotiation points because ultimately at the end of the day and this is like the harsh reality that democrats actually have to wake up to and look at those numbers from 2016 hillary clinton did not get the numbers she needed in the african-american community or basically any community Every vote, a voter constituency was depressed, except women over the age of 50. And, and, and that was, and they say that what, what, you know, women over the age of 50 didn't turn out. No, they turned out exactly where they had historically. You know, they were trying to win over the, like, the Republican white women that never voted for Democrats. Right. They always voted for Republicans. So ultimately, it was those making under $50,000 a year of every demographic, maybe Latinos spiked a little bit, but for the most part, He has to take this seriously because if they're going to depress the vote in Florida by putting poll taxes forward and who knows what else they'll do, they're going to depress the vote in Michigan and and Wisconsin with a with a history of of suppressing the vote like real voter suppression. Then he has to take every single vote seriously and not just say, I am not Trump, because that's what Hillary did. And we saw where that went. Yep, I agree. Totally. Minimal effort, minimal effort. 
And, and at the very least, don't go on there and say like, uh, yeah. uh, I'm not Trump, nan, 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 nan. I mean, that's right. basically what it was. Like, I'm going to shove this in your face. Like, you got nowhere else to go. That's exactly like, what it that, is. You know, it may be the case that, um, I, and from my perspective, we have nowhere else to go. But there's a lot of people out there. The candidate still has to do some work and convince people, like, they may not have anywhere else to go, but they also may decide not to go anywhere. Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm starting to worry about is no politician who's who's really been in, in public life this long would articulate that out loud unless it was like Hillary Clinton. I really, I think that there's something cognitively, like maybe these are private conversations that are happening behind the scenes, like Rob, and he's just saying them out loud. Like I, no That's filter. exactly what I think. That's exactly what I think. I mean, you get, I mean, I, I, you get that almost with Trump too, right? It's like right. somebody whispers in his ear, he's just like, yeah, uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine. And, and I think that um, Biden, has like he's not doing the basic in that interview he's not doing the basic politicianing which is like if you want to make this about trump then don't say dumbass things right don't say dumbass things don't be all you know self-righteous when you get a legitimate question of like what are you going to do for the black community like have an answer for god's sakes i mean do the basic like i don't know prep for your interview, because yeah. apparently they were very worried about putting Biden on there. As and, they should have been. <laughs> and they should have been. Uh, and, but apparently, like, their worry did not translate into, like, here, here are the things that you're going to go on and actually have, like, a, you know, an, an informed conversation. A little mm-hmm. bit annoying. Calling from an 845 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sam, it's Lauren. How are you? Teacher Lauren, how are you? I am. I'm doing okay um aside from not teaching right now right fingers crossed for september um so i am calling to talk about a couple of voting things that are specific to new york um first off appropriately school budget votes um school districts should be sending all of you new yorkers Uh, ballots for the budget vote. If you don't get your ballot in the mail by May 29th, contact your district office. Hmm. It is super important that budgets pass this year. Um, So districts are just sending out ballots. It's not like what the Board of Elections is doing, which is the other thing that I wanted to discuss. Um, So as you know, our presidential primary is back on by court order. Right. Kellner at all had the good sense not to take this to the Supreme Court because they don't want to be the guys to set that precedent, I hope, about canceling elections. But um, anyway, in New York, um, if you want to vote absentee, you need to apply for your ballot. And um, they are sending out ballot applications, not the ballots themselves. So New Yorkers, apply for your absentee ballot. You need to give them a reason. Um, If you check off the reason, temporary illness or physical disability, they are accepting that reason from everyone. Fill out your application, check off temporary illness or physical disability, get that ballot and vote for Bernie. Um, And that's- You can go to New York, if if you go to New York City Uh, absentee.com, they've updated it a little bit. So you don't have to have to physically have the app, the application sent to you and then send it back. You can actually do it digitally now, but that's only New York City. Yeah, so I don't New think York that's, City, that's New York City. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Teacher Sam and I are both and state, so. Do this now. Actually, I actually have that uh, literally on my uh, to do list is to uh, get that uh, absentee ballot. I'm going to go on and just have them. I'm just going to have them send it to me and see if I can do. Uh, I haven't gotten the application yet, but um um, well, you can also, you can print out um, exactly. the absentee ballot application at elections.ny.gov. Yes, so. folks should do that. We'll put that link up there. Teacher Lauren, thanks so much. Appreciate the call. Stay safe. You're welcome. I have one more thing. Yeah. If you have a sec. Um, that racist lady in Central Park. Yeah. Um, her, her job saw the video. So she's on administrative leave and she's had to surrender the dog back to the place where oh she adopted it from so oh my god this dog what mm. 
Wow. The, the dog is back at the, uh, at the rescue and. Well, I hope fine. somebody adopts that dog. Who's not oh going God. to like hang it by the collar for God's sake. Oh God. I'm sure that dog is going to go to a much, much better home now. All right. Thanks for the update on that. Appreciate wow. it. Oh, sure thing. Okay. Right. Love you. Bye. Bye-bye. Let's go to the uh, IMs. Uh, Colin from Nebraska. Sam, you look like, insert anyone with a mustache. Thank you. <laughs> Binder Dad, ordered face max, dad cap, and bandana. This is from the uh, Majority Report merchandise at shop.majorityreportradio.com. More importantly, Sunday was old Matt's daughter and my granddaughter's first birthday. Can we get a shofar for Enid? Give another for your stash. Uh, we'll roll them together. Uh, here it is, Enid. Happy belated birthday. <laughs> Woody Guthrie's guitar, Karl Marx's brother, hashtag Cedar Stash. Uh, Thames Darwin, Sam, like many fans, I've continued to think about your mustache. I disagree with the assessment of Jewish Serpico. However, I thought it was more 70s porn stash, but landed on Beta Stalin. Your mileage may vary. Thank you. Beta Stalin. Yeah. Mass Gothic, do you remember when you had that prank caller on who pranked uh, Republican shows and you said it was okay to uh, J-O to sh your show? Uh, I'm not gay, but I'm going to try another J-O-ing to my mustached boomer. I don't understand. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't get it. Joining to my mustache boomer? I'm not sure. No, J-O-ing. That's a reference to the Chris James prank phone call character, the FAP master, who calls up right wing radio show hosts and slowly reveals that he's masturbating to them. Oh, okay. oh, oh I see. J O. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. All right. Well, I, I appreciate that. That's very, that's very nice. That, that makes me feel good. Uh, a square. Hello, uh, MR. Sam uh, heard him on TMBS and Gastella will be absolutely a great guest. Would also love to hear him and Jamie discuss their respective views on labor, socialism, and party politics. T.B. Evans, a new member here, joined for the Cudlow impersonations. Ah, well, we'll give you one of these. Noah from uh, Tampa. The debate with Kyle Kalinske is definitely different than the debate with Jimmy Dore because Kalinske isn't advocating for people to vote like him. In fact, he says, under no circumstances should you vote for Trump. And to be honest, that sounds like a boring debate. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to hold off before. I, I just feel like it's too early to uh, have that type of, uh, of debate, frankly. But since you mentioned Jimmy Dore, um, <laughs> let's get like, I mean, this is just interesting to me in terms of a trajectory. I mean, one of the things that keeps sort of like echoing in my head is that Jimmy Dore came on my program around this time, maybe it was July of 2016, and promised me that what was going to happen is Donald Trump is going to get into office. The Republicans hate him. They're going to stymie everything he wants to do. He's not going to get anything he wants. The Democrats should be able to filibuster uh, a Supreme Court justice. Um, and then uh, what's going to happen is we're going to get a progressive candidate because Democrats are going to learn their lesson, whatever that means. And we're going to get a progressive candidate in 20. Uh, in 2020, uh, probably Elizabeth Warren, I think is what he said at the time. And um, none of that, of course, happened. He was 100% completely wrong. Um, and just to give you a sense of where you go from there, if you really don't want to, um, if you really don't want to have to reconcile the fact that all of your, uh, uh, 12 dimensional chess in um, saying that uh, Trump was not going to be any worse than Hillary Clinton doesn't work. Uh, then what you got to do is it just, you've got to basically get your talking points from uh, Costco Kevin who came on the program the other day about maybe this whole COVID thing is not really that big of a deal. I don't know how you are all feeling. I am ready uh, to go out and get this virus and get back to life. Um, I, I was just saying before we started that it depends on what the death rate is. If the death rate's under 1%, I think we're overreacting. But I don't know what the real death rate is. And so 
there's a lot of people making a point, and I think it's a good argument, I think it's worthy of debate, that if the pain and suffering, meaning death, which would be created by an economic depression, which we're creating, it, that, that will cause pain and death. Uh, so if that pain and death caused by the economic devastation and depression that's coming that may never leave, if that is greater than the pain and suffering caused by the virus, then we're not making a rational choice. Right. But uh, we need to get the right data. So Pause I don't, it for I, one you, you keep getting Pause it for one uh, people. Now, listen, there's no data like we don't know. The thing about this coronavirus is we don't know how many people have died. Now, obviously, right now, it's um, if you go by the official numbers, there's something like 1.8 million, 1.7 million uh, official cases, confirmed cases of COVID-19, mm -hmm. and uh, about 100,000 deaths. So we're, I don't know, what is that, like 5 or 6% uh, death rate. But, of course, there are undoubtedly more cases of COVID-19, and um, there are undoubtedly more deaths associated with uh, COVID-19 because we know year-over-year -year numbers of people who have died during these times is higher than it was before, and we know that other deaths are down because we're social distancing, because we're, you know, business not happening. Now, the, we, but we don't know, but we don't know for sure. But of course, I mean, it's the most obvious thing in the world. We know if, it's worse fact, than better. That's that we verifiably know. Right. But if not many people are dying from this relative to how many people are catching it, if then maybe, yeah, that's true. That's all true. That's, you know, completely like um, um, uh, 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 ridiculous. But the point is that we don't know. And so you take precautions. And yes. We should be going out and figuring out how to sort of live with the disease. Uh, the 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 epidemiologist that we had on, um, gosh, I always forget his name, but it, it was um, uh, Osterholm. Michael yeah, Doctor uh, Osterholm was like, we need to learn to live with the disease, without a doubt. Yeah. But you know, one of the things that's clear that's happening in Georgia, they opened up and no, people aren't going out to restaurants. They're not going out to these places. Oh, uh, they are here because. <laughs> People don't want to take this risk because there's a very large risk. Arizona. It's real. But continue on because then it's starting to go into like, well, this is the thing. You got to both sides of this stuff if you're going to be able to get into the type of media streams that he wants to get into. This is Costco Kevin stuff. That is greater than the pain and suffering caused by the virus. Then we're not making a rational choice. Right. But we need to get the right data. So I don't, I, you know, you keep getting, uh, people are under, they, some people say they're under reporting the deaths and then, then you hear they're over reporting the deaths. They're telling doctors in the hospitals to over report, doesn't matter. And then they're saying, well, people are being buried and they don't know if they died from it. Right. What? Yeah, That's exactly. That's not true at all. That's like, they're over reporting the deaths? Who's the they yeah, that exactly. is telling them to over-report the coronavirus deaths. So what this is, I listened to that painful Joe Rogan, Elon Musk interview, and I don't know if you've heard it, but I decided to listen to it, the three hours or whatever it was. And a, a solid like quarter of that interview was entertaining conspiracy theories regarding COVID. And I'll give a little bit of credit to Elon Musk. At least he could justify it a little bit more than, than uh, Jimmy Dore is here in that, he was like, the data is not great. True, the data is not great, but rarely in times of crises that we've never dealt with something and there's no institutional structure set up and the CDC is not being funded and you know, so many different reasons as to why the data is not great. But there is definitely some sort of messaging being put out there and tested in this like weird, weirdo, like populist right conspiracy space. And, and, it, and, and I mean, it's, it's capitalist. I mean, it's like the Elon Musk capitalists yes, that are going on Joe exactly. Rogan. And leaning in and and like they need to justify they don't want to sound like they don't see coronavirus, but they need to justify that the costs on the economy, which is exactly what Jimmy said, are worse than the actual coronavirus. Let's just remind everybody one person came here to the US and spread it in Seattle. And then one person came to New York and spread it to the Hasidic community in Brooklyn and back to Westchester. And then it spread like a wildfire. So we may have flattened the curve, you know, temporarily, 
but it has every potential. We don't go out and have some sort of precautions in place. If we don't, if we're not all wearing masks, it's not going away until we're all affected by COVID. And it's not like, I mean, it is completely right wing um, uh, talking points. Uh, David Dan in his uh, at the American Prospect is a great piece about the the right wing uh, corporatists who are pushing this. They tried to push it for Easter. Everybody comes out in Easter. You know, there is a there is a there is a leftist perspective and critique of this, which is we need as a government and a society to provide for people. We can argue as to like what's the best mechanism in terms, terms of doing that, without a doubt. But we need to aggressively provide for people to pay them to social distance, to pay them to not go to work so that we're taking care of people. When you start talking about like those things where this this whole closing down is causing us, uh, 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 you know, are uh, ruining our economy and uh, going to cost more uh, lives, et cetera, et cetera. All you're doing is you're carrying water for these right wing corporatist messages. And I, I don't know that he does it consciously. I, I, I happen to think that he's just not that bright and he doesn't do much work on this stuff. But I mean, be, and, and it's I think it's a function of his news sources, but maybe it's also a function of like where he knows his audience is. But th- these are right wing talking points. You want to get on there and say like, look, this is creating economic hardship and it's creating emotional hardship on people because they're worried about, you know, they've lost their jobs and they're worried about uh, where they're going to go. Uh, and, and what's going to the future is going to bring. Well, there is a fix for that. That's right. And the fix for that is to go out and do what other countries have done. That's pay right. uh, companies to pay their employees to stay at home. The Social fix for that is there. expanding uh, Medicare or Medicaid, however you want to do it and provide for people's health insurance. The fix for that is to maybe like, you know, roll out a significant amount of testing so that we can get a sense of like who can go in and maybe provide daycare for kids Mm -hmm. who can go in and provide health care for people. I mean, there is a lot of answers. The answer is not just like, we don't know. They could be inflating the death count, you know, and uh, we can't really trust the authorities in this instance. I mean, it's, it is, um, it's, it's really sort of gross. I got to say. How can you say you're for Medicare for all and then, be okay with opening up the economy. This is this is batshit nuts and dangerous. And I hope anybody listening that's on the left pushes back on this because this is such a little slippery slope area where you have these libertarians kind of inserting themselves into leftist programming. And it's extremely dangerous right now. Extremely dangerous. Um, all right, let's uh, go on to uh, what else do we have here? Oh, well, here's... I mean, really, like this is a uh, a prime example of another right winger who is out there, you know, promoting this notion that like maybe this whole thing is like being ginned up. Maybe they, whoever they are, yeah. in this instance, we know who uh, Brian Kilmeade thinks they are. Maybe they're pumping like the death, uh, the you know, the number of deaths. Like, I mean, I, I was curious like how this works. Like the hospital administrator gets a call from uh, Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo says, hey, we need uh, more deaths in New York uh, because it's going to reflect well on me. Or or maybe it's like, um, you know, um, uh, what's, I can't even remember his name now. Uh, uh, Perez, uh, you know, uh, 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 or, or who, I don't know who's calling. Tom Perez? In. Yeah, maybe Tom Perez is calling in. He's like, we need this for the DNC. Uh, so uh, could you uh, please inflate the number of deaths? I'm calling every uh, hospital administrator I can. Sam, it reminds me of the Holocaust deniers. That's what this is. This is, listen to this. This is Kill Mead saying like, um, uh, blue states are self-sabotaging to stop Trump. Let's see if I Joe Biden is not going to want the scrutiny on what he did with the $800 billion in stimulus package because there was no shovelry projects. And when you do an actually accounting of this, this is not going to be a plus from him. Plus, his own chief of staff, Ron Klain, said that when Joe Biden was in charge of H1N1, they got lucky. Uh, There was nothing that they did. Look back at the political quotes as they dug up that story. And keep in mind, too, it's small gains, but they are gains. Trucks are uh, truckloads are growing again. Air travel and hotel bookings are up slightly mortgage applications are rising and more people are opening up new businesses if you could get some of those blue states to believe in their small business people on their main streets in their state you will see this economy begin to come out of the ashes but they're too concerned about who gets credit and what presidential candidate will win in november 
Now, contemplate the reasoning here. We think about what the incentive structure is here, folks. You're a governor of a blue state. And you are going to sacrifice your own political career so that Donald Trump doesn't get credit for an economy bouncing back. And so therefore you're going to keep everybody inside. Think of how demented, like, like w- what goes on in Brian Kilmeade's mind that he thinks this can be the argument. It's the same argument. Like they are, uh, they're juicing the death counts. Like what, wh- what is the incentive structure for a hospital to do that? What is the incentive structure for anybody to do that? Government funding, of course. Are, I mean, a hospital is going to get more funding. No, if you, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm like entertaining there's, there. Right. Well, I mean, the other side of it is, and if, if you really want to start like, so, so now they're starting to estimate how many people are leaving New York permanently. Like, how does that benefit any Democrat? No, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's absurd. This, this talk is absurd. And, you know, look, if, if we're very lucky, and I think it's, I mean, we would have to be extremely lucky and we would have to run contrary to what all the experts know about, you know, pandemics and maybe every pandemic has its own sort of like uh, features. Maybe this is, um, this is, you know, we lose 1500 people uh, a day in this country. This is the lucky scenario. And then at one point it just like, then it's like we losing, you know, 800, 500, 200, 100, 20 people a day, and that's it. Uh, and then it just goes away after a couple of months. That would be great. But um, to bet on that is extremely, extremely dangerous because you cannot go backwards in time. You cannot say, oh, we made a mistake four weeks ago. And now we're going to try and bottle this up, particularly now, like that, that report from Columbia, right. had we reacted four or five weeks earlier, we could have saved tens of thousands of lives. No, but and, we know the answer. I don't, I don't understand why we're even entertaining this. Like, why is it, we know every epidemiologist has said that you're going to have waves of this and that, that the, the best case scenario is that most citizens you know, most, most people get infected, but they've built up some sort of resistance to it, but it's a novel virus. So that's not even guaranteed. I just don't, I I don't see the logic here. And I think, you know, if this had happened in a non-election year, I'm very curious to see how this crisis would have been dealt with. Yeah. That's a good point. Here is, um, you want more evidence? I mean, remember, I just like the, the words they might, might be, we don't know. We don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't hyping the death count. Yeah, the the, the Jimmy Dore line. Here's Dennis Prager. Oh God. On with Janine Pirro. Uh, Well, that's right. This is the basically this is part and parcel of the entire sort of like over of of right wing talking points here, which is like there's conspiracy theory that this is that 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 somehow this um, this pandemic is a um, it's like a test case. It's like they're doing something with this. They're driving this for a reason. And then it's just like all bets are off as to what you ascribe it to. Well, that's right. Well, look, they don't. The, the Democratic Party is no longer liberal. It is leftist. And one of the distinguishing distinct distinctions between left and liberal is the attitude toward the free market. The left has never embraced it and liberals always embraced it. So there's one other thing that you said that I smiled when you said it. A distinguishing feature between conservative. We should just say uh, that our guest today, uh, Zach Carter, when we were talking about the intellectual history uh, that he's written about uh, John Maynard Keynes, um, made it quite clear that morons like this guy and Dave Rubin, who talk about um, liberal, they're basically using the word as it was used at a different uh, era. Uh, which involved basically libertarians who um, who were, you know, uh, Hayek, uh, Hayekins and von Miesians uh, coming from Mount Pelerin. But go ahead. And I smiled when you said it. 
a distinguishing feature between conservative and left is the moment I hear somebody ask the question you asked, gee, what are the consequences? I know I'm talking to a conservative. There, there is no asking on the left, gee, what are the consequences? What are the consequences of closing down the economy of the world? And by the way, it was also done by, by non-leftists, I fully acknowledge. And, and, a, and a, a liberal regime in Sweden did not do it. I, I never thought I would say, God bless Sweden, but I do now. Sweden, yes. uh, if yes. there is a second wave, will be the most prepared society for a second wave in the world. And, and how do you think this ends? I've only got 10 seconds. How, and when is this going to be over? Uh, yes, it, it's not going to be over. Uh, w once you get away with authoritarian practices, they will be repeated. This is a uh, this is a dress rehearsal for a police state in the name of global warming. <laughs> wow. Dennis Prager always. Wow. Even Janine Pirro was like, I don't know if I can handle that one. I think the question she was asking, like, when is this whole hoax of the coronavirus going to be over? And he was like, never. This is <laughs> and also this didn't know we were like in love with the police, the police state, the leftists. That's where it gets a little. Uh... It also sort of undercuts his point that it's not just leftists who are doing this. It's really everybody who cares about science. Yes. It's really anybody who has any type of responsible uh, reaction to a public health crisis. Mm hmm. But we're gonna for for the sake of this little uh, sketch we're, sketch we're doing, uh, Janine. We'll call them leftists because that works better. Uh, final call of the day, calling from a seven one six area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Amber from Buffalo. Amber, hey, hold Buffalo. on. Will you back? Will you back off your phone hey. just a little bit, Amber? Oh, yeah. Is that better? Nope. nope. Go back. Oh dear. Oh, no, no. Okay. There you go. Uh, oh, that's you? great. You that's me? great. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? All right. Mostly I'm just calling because I'm living in a constant state of depression about them making us, everybody trying to convince us to live in an alternate reality, including in this case, Cuomo. Um, I don't know if people know so much with things with that. I think the numbers are mostly okay, but I didn't know, uh, are you guys aware at all of the stuff with, um, in my opinion, uh, messing with the metric timeline for reopening? Um, I'm not sure I'm what, I'm not sure you got to be more specific, but yeah, you, yeah. Amber, you got to yeah. back off. I get, or I'm going to have to let you go. You got to back oh. off your phone. It's just too hot. Okay. Okay. Say again. I got you like, I got you like away from my. A little bit closer, a little bit closer than that. Okay. <laughs> right? There? Yeah. A little bit further. You okay. Know, this is some happy medium. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Um, basically there's a, you need a two weeks of declines in hospitalizations and deaths. Um, Western New York was not doing well. We were doing a little bit better for being in the same state with New York city, obviously. So we shut down a little earlier in our timeline, but, um, we, our hospitalizations and everything was still trending up. We didn't fit the timeline. And then people announced that actually they were going to reset the clock from when New York pause ended on the 15th and only count the two weeks from then. So they only counted three days of data and then put us into phase one. Wow. Um, and so I don't know if that was under Cuomo or Hochul's the one in charge of the region right now, um, but it's just craziness because now we're getting ready to go into phase two and we haven't even gotten the results yet of the two weeks going into phase one because See, we're only coming up on the time where the effects of that would take place. Well, Amber, and I appreciate the call. Thank you. Um, and I, I think, I think this, that basically proves the point where the inf the incentive structure lies. The incentive structure lies even in blue States to sort of wrap this up as quickly as possible and, and go into denial as quickly as possible. And look, again, we may get lucky. We may be going into a lull and we may, you know, but we don't know. The thing is you set benchmarks so that you are cutting out the emotional response to coming back out. You set those benchmarks 
when you're at the, in the worst case scenario, so that you hold those benchmarks so that, you know, I mean, that's just like, it's just, it's, 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 it's just, I don't know. It's the best way to approach anything for that matter. Right. Like you, and you hold those benchmarks, but we're not doing that. And in some instances, here is um, this clip. Chris Cuomo is introdu- uh, is interviewing Rebecca Jones from a couple of days ago. She's talking about how they did basically this thing in uh, Florida where DeSantis is like, I don't want to know what's going on in terms of uh, these statistics because we're going to reverse engineer this. We're making a decision. You make the statistics fit that decision. Exactly. Were you asked to do that was so in unusual and improper and in your opinion wrong? Well, the first time I was asked to do something improper was in April. And when I brought basically what the results of whether or not each county could open to superiors, they essentially told me they did not like the results. How so? What does that mean they didn't like? Help us understand. The results didn't match the report for reopening that had already been written, uh, basically saying that a lot of rural counties, because of a, a wide range of reasons didn't meet the criteria that the state had outlined in order to qualify for reopening. Whereas some more populated counties did meet that criteria. And I was told that specifically, and this is a quote, we can't tell Jackson and Franklin County that they can't reopen, but Broward and Miami Dade can. Now, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think the nature of those counties also has another type of story that's going on there in terms of like where people are located and who Mm -hmm. uh, uh, populates those counties. Um, I mean, I would imagine there's a general pressure of like, you can't let one county open and then other counties not. But in some instances, uh, there's a little more of a sense of aggrievement with one nature of one county. But I don't know enough about that to make that type of uh, blanket statement, but I suspect that there that's involved there. Um, but we see this dynamic across the country. It's not as um, naked as this, where you're like suppressing right. data. But in some instances, it's like we're just going to ignore our own criteria for which to open up. All right, uh, folks, we're not going to do any more phone calls. Uh, I apologize, but we will. Okay. There you go, Bing Bing. Um, I'll do a couple IMs and then we'll get out of here. Uh, Rick from Florida. I don't really follow Joe Rogan's podcast anymore, but I have noticed he's been going off the deep end lately with the coronavirus lockdowns and even getting to some right-wing conspiracies like Obamagate. It's more disturbing as he was asked where he gets his news from. He cited Kalinsky, Door, and Rising with Crystal and Sager. These are supposedly shows for progressives, and yet they all seem to turn their audience against Democrats. Weird. Well... The Chris Lapaco video has surfaced of Minneapolis police killing a man by kneeling on his neck while he handcuffed. Police use this technique all the time. and it seems pretty obvious to me it could kill someone easily. I would imagine that there'll be protests uh, will be met with more aggression by the police than the reopened protests received here. Here's the video. Oh, geez. Uh, we'll take a look at this. Tomorrow. I can breathe. Oh, God. Please knee my dick. Oh, geez. Horrible. Wu-Tang Klang, that woman in Central Park was pulling an Emmett Till, and she knew the mortal threat against Mm. Mr. Cooper by going to hysterical white woman voice. She knew what the potential was, and she did it on purpose. I I agree with you. Right. I mean, that was horrifying. Horrifying. More so than even like the, you know, like those, those videos of like, that were going around for a while where it's like some uh, white woman, like sort of like crazed. It's like, you get off my property. And like, like where they're just being, just bigoted as opposed to sort of like coldly calculating. This was manipulative. This was, yeah, strat- yeah. it was. Uh, Bullprog, Minneapolis police recently killed a black man by kneeling on his neck for several minutes. Yeah, yeah we just got yeah, the video. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. talk about it tomorrow. Bullprog, uh, Jimmy Dore, you've got people saying the earth is round and then you've got people saying it's flat. So I don't know what to think. 
Tomcat. Hi, Sam. It was my 31st birthday yesterday, but I was also told that day to isolate for a week as someone in my workplace has tested for coronavirus. Can I get a show far for my birthday in solidarity with those going through the same thing? Also, I've seen that the MR store only ships to the U.S. and any international shipping options for European distribution on the horizon. Thanks. What's the story with that, Brendan? Are we working story on it? The story is we are working on it and it should be up and running in the next few weeks. This is for uh, Brendan. International shipping. And this is for Brendan and for a Tom Cat's birthday. Four more. Sam's uh, CBD tincture before bed. Sam, your stash makes me believe you could have been a host on this old house in some other life. Just imagining you and Tommy <laughs> ripping lumber and building a deck. Also, Phillips Robertson or Torx. Uh, Torx, are you serious? It's not even close. Although square, not bad. I guess that's Robertson, right? Um, but yes, I'm, uh, I'm fully on board with the uh, Torx. Totally. You'd be surprised. You'd be, you'd be very surprised how, how close to the truth that is. Majority Report, Zach, Sam, when the Reed story dropped, you said it's likely that if the accusations were true, there'd be more accusations coming. Since it's been months and no other woman has claimed Biden raped or assaulted her, does that make Reed's claims less true? Further, have you covered further reporting about Reed and her claims, like her pathological past, lying about getting a degree, her friend and brother changing their stories, no alcoves found where Reed said the rape happened, etc.? cetera? Um, I do think that the claims are, you know, undermined by more people not coming out. Um, I'm not as convinced that her troubled past um, diminishes those claims. Um, I don't know about the alcove. And even that is like a little, uh, when you start to go down the rabbit hole, uh, there's, you know, the, the, the troubled past, I, I'm not even buying that entirely. I think the the the, the neoliberals, frankly, like uh, there's a cadre of people who are doing this online. They've sort of misrepresented things that have happened, like how she stated she got her degree and she was very forthright and then she provided documentation as to it. And like, but this is all meant to discount anything she says. And And for all we know, there are, there may be, I'm not saying that there is, but like, there might be people that are trying to get this story out and they're not able to because right. that's I the- situation that we faced today. right and we do know like there has been um uh and, and there's also we should also say that her attorney um right quit resigned uh but her attorney also tried to make it about as clear as you could that this was not a function of her his perspective on on whether she he thought that she, that uh, that her story was true um, you keep in mind what it means i'm not representing her in this case at this moment, the pressure he's under, I don't know what his reasoning is. He hasn't been extremely clear about it. It could have been payment for all, we don't know, but they're going to take everything and they're going to amplify it and weave it together. Like it's some sort of grand conspiracy. And I just think all of us should pause a little bit because it doesn't help create a system where victims feel comfortable, you know, stepping up, whether or not, whatever happened in this situation, you know, some, there's that term I mean, useful idiots for a reason from, you know, from the beginning, my uh, perspective on this is that we will never know uh, the truth. And, um, you know, I have my own like personal uh, perspective on this that is, you know, just based upon, you know, the available facts and just sort of my sense right. of like, contemplating what a guy like that would have been like in 93. Mm -hmm. And like I say, in my mind, it's quite possible that, 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 that something like that happens. And Joe Biden at that time walks away thinking like, I'm an upstanding guy. She said no. And I took no for an answer. And, uh, you know, that at the time it would be like, yeah, that's a come on. Like, that's just the way I come on. That's my come on line you know, uh, in that situation. Um, I I don't know though. And. uh, Well, his, his, his disconnect from the situation. I, I, I keep going back to this, this Chris Dodd appointment reason, right? Like 
you are on another planet. You don't see victims or sexual assault at all through the same definitions of 2020 standards. If you continue to have Christad on the vice presidential selection committee of four people, Christad who has assaulted women and I mean, harassed women. Right. Like uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a data point that he has no understanding of it. Uh, it's also a data point that maybe like there are people on the, on the, on the campaign saying like, Hey, I got an idea. We'll put people on there who have done stuff that is worse than what you, you, you know, right. you know, uh, you know, that it's like people and maybe it'll make it look better. I have Listen, no idea. Sam, I have a very, just as a side note that we, we talk about this on the show this week with the ostracism, we talk about Ronan Farrow and like how now people are, are breaking through his, his reporting of me too, but you know, we have to keep in mind here that Anita Dunn represented Harvey Weinstein. Anita Dunn is a senior advisor to Joe Biden. And I think there's a real effort right now to undermine the Me Too movement and what breaks through and what doesn't so that there aren't situations moving forward in which every story gets examined. Right. Um, because I couldn't understand why, like, suddenly Ben Smith was so, and, and, and Matt Lauer, so why now? And it seemed very... Like he already won a Pulitzer for his reporting. <laughs> like Weinstein's already, you know, more or right. less in jail, although he's released for COVID. Why now? It's a good question. Uh, I think maybe the opportunism, right? That people are taking advantage of that, maybe. Disco mm -hmm. Stu, would you say the, um, oh. uh, please don't ignore Taibi being on that door segment. He's mm. also swallowed the red pill and is not pumping pro, is not, not pumping pro Trump conspiracy theories just like door. Well, I mean, I, I, he wasn't talking in that segment. Uh, Chris from Taiwan, that mean white lady from the Central Park video donated to Barack Obama and Pete Buttigieg. Whoa. Uh, Arconics. That doesn't surprise me at all. Not at all. Uh, Joe Biden not committing to stop the building of the border wall seems like a great way to win over uh, Hispanic Latinx voters. And then adding that he will not spend a lot of money on the wall is a good compromise. I know. Um, Final I am of the day. <laughs> Sam, any truth to the rumor that Paul F. Tompkins is suing you for theft of his mustache? I cannot <laughs> comment at this time. Uh, Nomi, take care of yourself. Folks, I'll check out Nomi Show. Check out Nomi Show. Thanks so much. All right, <laughs> All folks. Right. See you tomorrow. <laughs> it might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Choice was made.